Yo, is the mic on mic? They turn their mic on mic And pour us another one Let's do it right though, mic We feeling nice though, mic Gather round, gather round And turn their mic on mic And turn their mic on mic Yeah, garage drinks with mic Woo! How are you feeling? Really good. I'm going to have good. another drink before Hello, we Alocina, welcome to the garage. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. That's so good. <sighs> nice and cool. On a Saturday afternoon, right? Absolutely. Coronas in the afternoon on a hot, muggy Auckland day. <laughs> <laughs> like... Hey, it's really good to have you. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Me too. I feel really privileged that you actually asked me. Well, I think what you do is important as well as I know you. Yeah. But I think like what you do is really important. I think that what you do actually is probably one of the hardest jobs. I That's think what so I think. too. <laughs> it's a pretty tough job. It, you know what? Like when people are like, oh, you get really cool holidays. I'm like, man, if you only knew <laughs> half the story, mm. people would be like, why did you choose that? <laughs> sure. For all our listeners listening, Alasina is a school teacher. Um, do you want to tell everyone what age group you teach? Um, I've got intermediate kids, so that's year seven and eight. But I also branch off to like, last year I was the year nine science teacher because we didn't have one. Right. So that was new learning for me. Lots of fun. To teach science or to teach any subject at that level, do you have to have like formal sort of education behind it or not really? No, but it's, it's like a general. It's, it's like because it's still middle school, so right. I can sort of get up to year 10 right. um, in subjects, but then year 11, that's when they start NCEA and that's when the specialised high school teachers come in. Right. But it did get me thinking like, maybe I could like retrain and come back as a chemistry teacher because mm. I enjoyed being in the lab so much. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. But then I was like, I don't like studying, so nah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy chemistry in high school? No. <laughs> I hate it. I like, I failed bio. <laughs> right. I didn't even make it to... I failed biology too. Yeah, I failed it twice. Right. But it's sort of, last year, what we wanted was to grow that love of investigating. Yes. And questioning. Yeah. And just figuring out how things work mm. and I really enjoyed that part. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so you work at a school, I'm not going to say the name, but up in the far north. Uh, how long have you been there for? This is going to be my fourth year living fourth in the far year. north. And I've been working there for four years. Yeah. Really different to working in the city. So I went from Wellington up north and that was like, wow. <laughs> How's it different from Wellington? Living in the city... I grew up, so I grew up in Palmerston North and then I went to Wellington for uni and I sort of stayed there and then living in the city, like city life and that's where all my cousins are, all my mates are. Mm. Um, so the change to rural. Ru yeah. I was ready for it though. Yeah. Because lots of people think I was forced to move up north. Right. Because my dad moved up north and they're right. like, oh yeah, so your dad told you to come here and I was like, actually no. He said, are you sure? <laughs> right. Are you sure? You but I said, yeah, I'm ready for that slower pace of life. Just wanted to change, yeah? Yeah. 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 And I really enjoy it. It's difficult at times. Not difficult, it's challenging at times. I but bet it is. from those challenges, I've like when I look back, I'm like, man, I've grown as a person yeah. so much. Yeah. And I don't think I would have grown like that in the city, maybe. Yeah, well, it's a pretty uh, mentally, physically, emotionally challenging job because you're dealing with children. Yeah. Um, however, though, like if we go right back to when you were younger, right, was being a school teacher what you always wanted to do? No. Right. Absolutely not. Because both of my parents are school teachers. Okay. So what did you not like about it if both your parents were school teachers? I, honestly, I it. loathed going to school with my mum because she was, she's the teacher that always goes on the weekends, does all her displays. She went in the holidays. And so I like, I was like, I'm never going to live this life. She'd mm. bring her marking home and I'd mark books with her. And I was just like, I'm not keen for this. <laughs> it's a job that really does extend outside it of the does. school gates, yeah. right? And then like she'd teach at primary school and when it was like year six graduation she'd be like oh you can do the year six dance <laughs> so I'd have to go in and choreograph a dance for the year sixes to do right and I was like oh man no I wanted to I wanted to be a neurosurgeon wow because I wanted to drive a Mercedes SLR 
Wow. And neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons do that. They drive that's Mercedes. In my head, in your mind. that's what I, and I was like, right, this is the car I want. What kind of job is going to provide me the income so I can drive that car? Did you have any interest in the human brain at all? No. Okay. And then <laughs> I figured out, <laughs> no, I was just like, I'm just going to have gloves, a mask and cut people up. And then I realized, one, I'm not actually... Some countries where they do, do do that without any qualification. They can't oh, yeah, do that's that. that's true. But However. I don't actually like blood. <laughs> okay. I don't like blood or sick people, yeah. so... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that dream uh, fizzled out quite quickly. Right. Um, and like I said, I didn't pass bio twice. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and then I thought, hmm, journalism. Okay. I thought journalism would be cool. Yeah. Because I wanted to be on TV. <laughs> I love how you have these ideas of what a career is going to be because yeah. of based of things, of stereotypes or something that you have of them. Yeah. And I was like... But you wouldn't oh. be the only one. Yeah. And then, I, and then so I, I, studied, I did one year of um, communications at uni and I was like, I really don't like this. Right. <laughs> it's too much hard work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was like, and then I was like, what else can I do? And I was like, what about photojournalism? <laughs> photojournalism. It's taking photos... What is that? What is that? I just thought it would be like <laughs> photography plus journalism equals a good time. Because <laughs> this is my mind, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And because like photography was my highest bursary. Okay. So I was like, oh yeah, I must be good at that if that photography and design. So I went and studied photography. At uni? At uni. Okay. And... For how long? Four years. So All my right. undergrad is in design and photography. Wow. I never knew that. Oh. Very cool. <laughs> It, it was cool, like. So you know then, everything about photography. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly. This is going great. <laughs> I like when I finished, and, and my nana was like, you know, art's not a real job. You should go back and become an accountant or a lawyer. Art's not a real job. Yeah, that's that island mentality of yeah. you know. And I was like, okay, that's well, so accounting, oh my maths, mm, maybe not. And I was like, law, that's too much reading. So she was just like, oh, okay, do photography. Do you still have a, like a deep passion for photography? I enjoy it as a hobby. Right. But all the, when you study something at university, it sort of took out the fun of it, you know, yeah. like because it was really technical. We learned about like running a business because it was like studio photography. It takes the romance out of it. Yeah. And it makes it black and white. Yeah. I like just being in the dark room, having that like time to develop my prints. Mm. I like the fine art sort of creative part of it, but mm. they wanted you to go into the industry, which is like, that's a good thing. Mm. But then I was like, oh, it's too rigid. Like I like having that freedom. Freedom. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. So my nana was like, well, what are you going to do? When I finished, she was like, what are you going to do now? And I was like, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> and this I, is after you got your degree? Yeah. You had any jobs lined up? No. Nope. Okay. Because yeah, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I just studied it's something I love. And then I was like, oh, expecting like life to be like, ta-da. Da-da-da-da-da, all yeah. lined out. Yeah. Mm. And it didn't. So um, my auntie was living overseas and she said, why don't you do your OE? And I was like, okay. This is your auntie Anne? Yeah. Yeah. Great lady. So she, so I, I did sort of a, uh, OE of sorts. Yes. I wouldn't say it was a traditional OE, um, but I had the opportunity to travel, and she really, she really grew my love of travel and experiencing different cultures and learning about other people, other places. Yeah, because that's something that can't really be um, ever learned unless you do it. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much to learn about yourself and about the world when you travel yeah. alone and go and experience other cultures and stuff, it really opens up your perspective to like, perspective to like how the world really is. Yeah. And it also, but I just, every time I came home, it made me really grateful to, to be, be from a New here. Zealander? Yeah. Right. And that's, and then I'd have like that reverse culture, culture shock because I was like, oh wait, I've been away <laughs> for so long. Like I, I need to like, Remember what it's like being in New Zealand. Like oh, the shops okay. aren't open twenty four seven. You can't just like yeah. hustle on the side of the street for. You Which know. Um, countries did you go to? Um, I travelled in China, mm. um, Shanghai. Like Shanghai was amazing. 
like you either love China or you don't. And I loved it. Mm. I loved the hustle and bustle. Everyone was busy. Everyone worked really hard. You could Man, you live off You would have stood out because you're very, very tall. People in northern China are really tall. Okay. Yeah. So. See, I assume. I yeah, yeah. I boxes and stereotypes. But lots of people <laughs> would say, oh, you know. But the Chinese thought I was from the north or they thought I was like American Chinese. American Chinese. Because of my height. So they were like, you must be a basketballer. And I was like. I don't actually play sport, but I'll go with it. <laughs> I'll go with it. <laughs> um, and Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, India. Wow. This India is all in your in... 20s, is that right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. India was cool. What did you like about India? The colour. Yeah. The colour. I wish I'd eaten more like... Street food. Street food. Like... After watching all the Netflix series, I'm like, man, if I could do it all over again, or like once COVID's over, I'm going to do it all over again and just do like a food tour. Yeah, right. Mm. Um, I guess India is a very textural place where it's yeah. like smells, colors. I've never been. I'd love to go, but yeah. it looks amazing from what I do see. And the history, like learning the history, because I went to all the, in Dubai, like the Middle East. I remember when I went to the Middle East and I was like, I actually don't know where I'm going. Right. And I was teaching at the time. Sorry. And the kids, I said to the kids, let's find out about Dubai because I'm going there next week. <laughs> and it was cool. Like they were like, oh, you should go here. You should do that. Oh, look at that building, miss. So, and then that grew their, their want, like after I went and came back. To learn like, about other countries. Yeah. How different is Dubai from New Zealand? It's so different. Mm. Like. Do you have to wear, uh, is it a burqa? Is that what they call I, it? Yeah, yeah. Nah. No. You didn't. It was like, you know when you, well, because I, I used to go to Samoa a lot with my nana. Yeah. It's just that common sense of being covered enough when you're in the village, you know, you wear your ear, love, love, and your t-shirt. So yes. I just wore shorts and a t-shirt. But I had that same thing. Like Conservative. I, yeah. Like, I wouldn't walk around New Zealand in a bikini, so why would I do that in Dubai? Like at the mall or anything. Right. Like on a beach, yeah, appropriate. Yeah. But at Dub and like walking down the street, like how many people here walk around in their togs? None. Yeah. So it's, it's things like that because I had that But you can wear your togs at the beach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I did. And I went to the beach by myself. Yeah. And just read my book, swam, and then walked home again. Mm. And it was fine. But people do have those stereotypes because I did. I bought like the first time I went to Dubai, I bought this... Like everything was long sleeve, long pants. I got there and I was like, I'm so hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people were just in like shorts, T-shirts, singlets, dresses. So what sort of strict rules do they have? Because I hear they do have some strict they do, rules. Um, like alcohol. Like there's What's, only certain, I think. We didn't you can't know. drink in public? Yeah. Can't like just roll up to a car park and. <laughs> <laughs> and bars. Like there's only certain like motel bars. Um, obviously like married couples What about them? Like you have to be married To be like affectionate in public Okay Boyfriend, girlfriend? But they, yeah, I don't think they do that no. Boyfriend, boyfriend? Definitely not No Not in public Not in public? Yeah Is it against the law? I think it is Boyfriend, boyfriend Girlfriend, girlfriend Is it against the law? I think so but don't quote me on that. I won't. I won't. But that's, um, yeah. I guess um, every country is different. Yeah. Um, it's a bit sad though. It is. But yeah. yeah, I just, I guess I never researched it hard out because that, I it was just me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really loved Dubai. And I was like, I could live here. And I had friends that taught in Abu Dhabi and... Teach English. Yeah. And just that international life, international school life. I was like, oh, this is easy. I could do yeah. that. And because then so like... Get paid well as well. Yeah. yeah. And my auntie grew that love of like traveling because she's been all over the place. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to live this life. Like where you can just jump on a plane and go. And then she said, well, what, what kind of job would you need to get so that you could live that life that you want? And I was like, maybe teaching, you know? Right, and that's where that started from. And that's from. where it started from. I see. And then I got into this mentality, like, two years, get registered, and I'm out of here, and I don't have to come back to New Zealand ever again because I'm going to live, like, a luxurious international high life. Yes. 
And you could. And here I am. Why still are you here. not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then... How, um, how long ago was this? I started teaching in 2012. Okay. Eight years ago. Yeah. So you never... And, and obviously COVID happened last year. Yeah. But prior to that, you never had the idea to take it overseas and teach There were a couple of times, Dubai. yeah, that I thought, yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to make heaps of money and buy a house, come home and buy a house because that's what everybody does. That's Is that what you want to do though? But that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, I just felt right. like everyone was buying houses. So I was like, oh, maybe I should buy one too. Nah. Yeah, well. <laughs> nah, <laughs> hell no. You should never do what other people do just because for the sake of what they're doing. Like, you should oh, always do that, things for what... It looks growing up. Like, you know, people are either getting hell married, no. having kids or buying a house. And I was like, oh, I'll buy a house. It's easier than the wow. other two. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but then, yeah, so I started teaching in Wellington in Lower Hutt. And my first two years, I was like, you know, I had that mentality. Like, two years and I'm out. That's it. I'm gone. What happened? I just, like, fell in love with the place and then realized, like, the kids that I taught. So it was a low decile school. What does low decile mean for people that don't know uh, what It's more is. got to do with the socioeconomic... Well, of the, the lower the decile, yeah. The lower the income, really, of that particular community. Yeah. So in New Zealand, it's rated highest decile is decile ten. Yeah. Then decile one, which is what do you think about that system, Alicina? <sighs> I think people have lots of misconceptions. About so they, it. yeah. Mm. Uh, like in my in my years of teaching and teaching mm. at different schools, like lower decile schools, man, the teachers are amazing. Right. They are. So creative and innovative, like in their teaching, and they're so for the people, and they're so passionate because it's 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 difficult because the resources are it, sure. You know, I guess what I'm asking is, does the decile system really reflect on like the quality of students? The quality of students or the quality of teaching? The quality of students. Ah, oh, nah, absolutely right. not. Why does it not reflect that? Do you um, think it's something that should change? The, the, I think the, people the, like to measure s- stuff because it makes them feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. You know? Yeah. So I've, I've, I haven't I've taught at a decile 10. My mum has. Um, it's like I a think, private school, right? Almost, yeah. Or almost. like really big. It was like a massive primary school, man. Where? In Palmerston North. Decile 10. Yeah. Okay. And I've taught at a... Six. That's probably mm. the highest I'll ever go. And it was cool, but I really love the the vibe of a low decile school and what's, the community. Um, what's the vibe about a low decile school? So I taught in Lower Hutt, so it was mainly predominantly Māori and Pacifica. Mm. So like poly club was life. And I, I was like poly club tutor and I love that life. I love poly club life. <laughs> and so do the kids. What's poly club? Polynesian club. Oh, it's like cultural club, I guess. Right. Like where you get to perform and just seeing, like listening to the different island languages in the playground, mm. watching kids interact and teach their first language to one another so that when they did see each other's parents, they could have something to say or they knew what people were talking about. Wow. Like that's cool. That's kids so singing, cool. like teaching each other their traditional songs is cool. Well, for me. Well, it does something to you as a Māori yeah. Samoan, yep. you know, hearing this. And then having, like, Filipino kids learning as well. And just that interaction, the community that the kids built within the school. Mm. I was like, man, adults should do this <laughs> more often. Very true. So that pretty much changed So that changed. I was just like, you know what? Not enough teachers that look like me in front of our kids. Right. Because when I came through school, I only had Palangi teachers. Right. Maybe when I first started, oh, I started school in Rotorua and I had one Māori teacher. But the rest, like when I was thinking about it, I was like, yeah, they were all Palangi. <laughs> Is it still like that? Um, I think more Māori and Pacifica people are like adhering the call to come and share what they know with our next generation. Yeah. But it's still like teaching's a hard job. 
Of course it is, yeah. It's, there's no glamour. <laughs> see, I think I see teaching as hard because probably a person that just doesn't have like amazing amount of patience. Like I always look at school teachers and think, you guys are so patient, man. Like, yeah. I don't know how you do it. Um, I don't think I'm a very patient person either. But then right. when it comes to my kids, like I, it's like something changes. I'm not very patient with adults because in my head, I'm like, you've had your time. Mm. Why are you acting childish? Mm. I was like, but our kids, like they're allowed this time to be, you know, to play up because mm. they're kids, you know. Yeah. And it's our job to have that patience and be calm with them so that when they're adults, they're not petty. <laughs> very true. Also, when I grew up in Tonga, mm. um, physical discipline was still quite a big thing. I'm not sure whether it still is. It probably still is. Yeah. But getting hit, like my first year at primary school, I averaged like one hit a day. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Thank yeah. you, Makarita. <laughs> <laughs> I averaged like one hit a day with the stick and it could be for anything. It could be like, I um, forgot to put a full stop. Yeah. Um, I was, I was pretty naughty as well. Like I'd play in the class. But were you naughty or were you just curious? And you were you were putting in, put in this like rigid school system. So, so back could, in the eighties, they never asked that question in Tonga whether yeah you're naughty or whether you're curious. <laughs> they just got to stick out and you just got to work. Yeah, until they shut up because yeah, it's like that conform. Yeah, you need to conform. You need yeah. to do it this way. Whereas now I like look at my kids and like when I first started teaching, I had that like you need to listen to me. Yeah. I, I'm the I'm the adult. Yeah, I know everything. But like my teaching journey has taught me like it's a reciprocal relationship you have with your kids because mm. they also have knowledge that I don't know, or they have skills that like can be utilized. Mm. And like my, I guess doing that sort of shuts them down in a way, and they start if it's done to them all the time, yeah. and they get used to being shut down, and so they start just. And shutting then they just down. have that negative mentality towards school. But school should be like a place where you can take risks, like, you know, be yeah. curious, yeah. inquire, and like have, like, it's a, it should be a safe place to fail so you can be like, okay, that didn't work, so what other avenues can I take or what else interests me? Yeah. How do you, um, you say now that it's more like a give take yeah. with students, but I guess it says more about a teacher, like when a teacher is like really strict and shuts a student down. Yeah. About them and their feeling of control. I th yeah. And that's a. <laughs> 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 like, for real, right? Yeah. yeah. And I remember once when I first started teaching, I was actually trying to. I was really mad at one student and he, and he was sitting with his best mate and I just like went off because I was like, I, I just need to break you. I need to make you cry. <laughs> so you know wow. who's alpha? Me. Yeah. <laughs> and I was going hard. But his friend actually thought I was talking to him and okay. he started crying. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, like, no, it wasn't, it was never you. <laughs> and I, I basically got on the angry bus and I couldn't get off because I was so worked up to try to like break this kid so that he knew like I was top dog. And he was just like, why is she going on about that? His best mate thought I was telling him off and he started crying because he was like, my mum and dad are going to give me a hiding. And I was like, oh, oh no, you're not the person I wanted yeah. to meet. And I felt so bad. And I was just like, man, I need to really reflect on what, what am I trying to do? Like, why is there a power struggle? And it should be like, we should be sharing, mm. you know, like I know stuff, you know stuff. Let's collaborate. Do they teach you sort of stuff at teachers training? No. They don't. They don't. No. Like heaps of stuff I never... Like you learn about like theorists like Vygotsky and you need to memorize it all for your exams. But I remember like in my first year of teaching, a fight broke out in my class and I was like, I have not read anything about this. <laughs> I did not like this was not in our exams. We never got any practice and I didn't know what to do. And I was just that's like. That's pretty crazy though, isn't it? Because that's probably, isn't that like you think like the interaction between the student and the te sorry, the teachers and the students is probably the most important thing to be taught at. Yeah. Yeah, training. well, I think they, they're starting to do it now. Right, right. But, um, so, like, I just looked at them, and they were, like, they were about to, like, have a fist fight, and I just started laughing because I was like, oh, I'm just, like, I really don't know what to do. So I, like, you know, that island cackle laugh, like, really loud so that all the kids stopped, and I was like, you know what, let's go outside, we'll have a circle, and you guys can have a go at each other because, like, let's make it fun. And the boys were so shocked. And they just like let each other go and they're like, what? And I was like, come on, we'll go. Let's go, go to the courts. 
And all the kids were like, this lady is nuts. <laughs> and I was like, but that's what you do, isn't it? Like, is this what you want, attention? What's going on? And like one got really upset. He's like, why are you laughing at us? And I was like, because this is silly. Did they fight? No, they didn't. I hate to tell you this, but that's what happened in my primary school. Really? For real. The two kids were fighting in the class. We'd go outside, sit in a ring, and they would fight. Yeah. Well, I knew, I knew like, because I was like, man, I really hope, you know that fake it till you make it? I was like, I really hope no one says, yeah, 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 let's go, miss, let's go outside. Because I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> what do I do if they actually agree? Right. But I was like, hopefully, like, but it was such a different approach. Yeah. Okay. That they were just, I was like, oh, my God, thank you. <laughs> like, whew, I'm glad oh. that we didn't have to go outside. Yeah. And, like, those kids are like, do you remember that time that you said we should go outside and have a fight? They were like, and I was like, yeah, I'm so glad you did it. Yeah. Because I could have, like, lost my job. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, um, when I was about six years old, I was in class two in Tonga, and the fight broke out between yeah. two kids. But it got vicious, man. Like, um, <sighs> one kid stabbed the other one with a pencil through the <laughs> cheek. That's not funny, but... Like, stabbed them through the cheek, and the other one... Um, I think bit him on the neck. Um, what happened? Where was the stick then? Who's the stick that you were getting hit with? Oh, they both got whacked. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they both got whacked. Yeah. But it was the first time I'd seen like, and I was a kid, but seen like a proper fight, fight like fight. that went yeah. crazy, crazy. These were six-year-olds. Yeah, man. Six-year-olds, man. Yeah. Um, why would you do something like that broke out? With six-year-olds? No, like in your... And does my, it, yeah, well, see, does, does yes, seven anything and like that ever break out in your classes? No. Kids get physical, but because I spend so much time building a learning relationship with my kids, that we have, like, I can just say to them, especially if they have other teachers, so if mm. they they that haven't had that time to build a relationship with the kids, so I'll be like on release, doing marking or admin and stuff. And then I'll get called back to my classroom. Right. And it's usually, and like someone will be like, Miss, we need you. And so I'll, I'll like head back over and I'll just, sometimes I just need to be at the doorway and they'll stop. And then, of course, oh, he did it. Oh, no, she's not on it. You just have to be at the doorway and they stop. And they'll just like look like, oh, no, like she's here. And I, and I don't yell at them because sometimes they're in a space where that's not going to be effective. So I'll just say, okay, we need some time out. Someone come out with me. We'll get a glass of water at the staff room. And then all your friends can take you to the water fountain. And then I'll just, and then giving them that time to actually say, yeah, I'm not mad at him or her. Like, this is what's happened to me. And I'm just like, this is how I'm releasing my emotions. And I'm like, okay, so what's a strategy we can do? Like, it's teaching kids strategies. Like when you're angry, you don't have to hit someone. (laughs) Mm. First, like, and sometimes, and I've I've seen kids learn, and they can do it. Like, they at the beginning. I had a kid, and they just would fight, like just rage. But then, when you spend time with them and teach them strategies, you can see them getting angry, and they'll say, "Miss, I need to go for a walk," and they'll walk it off. And then I'll say, okay, you walk to the playground. I'll sit all the rest of the class. I'll come talk to you. And sometimes they just need that five minutes, fresh air, drink of water, and then I'll have a chat. And they'll say, this, this, this happened. And I was like, I'm so proud. Like, telling kids that you're proud of them when they make massive steps like that. And parents are like, wow, my kid's so changed. Mm. And they just need, you just need to invest that time. Yeah. It's also hard as well because I guess like it's hard for you to because you don't know what they're going home to or you don't yeah. control that side of their life. No. You only control what happens inside yeah. the school gates. So from Monday to Friday they have like a routine. They know what's up. And some kids so like some kids on a Friday they'll play up because for Saturday and Sunday they don't have you around. Wow. So that's and they don't know how to tell you like oh I'm anxious or you know I'm worried about this. So they'll just play, and uh, like Friday afternoon, sometimes I'm just, I always make the kids do PE so they can just run around, get all their energy up. But the times that they do play up, that's in my head, I know, I won't say, oh, yeah, it's because on Saturday and Sunday you don't know what you're doing with your family. I'll just, I'll, I'll know that on Monday when they come back, they'll play up as well because they haven't seen you for two days. 
Damn. So, so on Monday, like, we do lots of mindfulness like mindfulness meditation, just breathing exercises as a class to just settle everyone after a weekend because I don't know what happened in their weekends. Not everyone has, like, good weekends. And not everyone can explain or verbalise that to you. So you just have to be like, okay, as a Hulk, like, mindfulness. That if you can learn that as, as a kid, it's going to help you when you're an adult too. You're like a sick and mother to these kids. <sighs> well, <laughs> up north they call me Fire Alucena. Right. Which took me a long time to get used to because I was always Miss T down in Wellington. And right. everyone knows me as Miss T. Like, at the mall, they're like, hey, Miss T. And I'm like, oh, hey. Like, who is this, like, grown man talking to me? I'm like, and I have to, like, quickly, like, when I'm talking to them, yeah. I have to figure out who I'm talking to because they're so different. They're, they've they changed change so much. fast, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, which school? Like, I have to try and figure out, like, when, I, when we're having a conversation, I have to try and figure out all these elements so wow. that I can be like... Oh hi, Mike! Like, how's your mum? Yeah, or like, how's true. your little sister? Yeah. So you never think that when you see like a school teacher like on a public and you say hi, you just yeah. assume they know you. Yeah. But you don't. You forget that they have taught hundreds of other students. Yeah. And like, even because my mum was a teacher and I spent lots of time with her at school, um, recently at Christmas time we went to a funeral, and there was a guy there, and I said to her, "Didn't you teach him?" And she was like, "I don't know." She was like, "That grown man." And I was like. I'm sure he went to such and such school. And she's like, oh, I really don't know. And he was staring. So I said to her, well, go and say hi. And she goes, what if it's not him? And I was like, oh. So I went up and I go, oh, did my mum used to teach you? And he goes, yes, Miss Ota. I was just like, um, yes, Miss Ota taught me at blah, blah, blah schools. Wow. And lucky because <laughs> I called him Kane, but his name was Zane. <laughs> I go, is your name like Kane or something? And he's like, it's Zane. And I was like, oh, I was close. <laughs> If you have a good teacher, that stuff sticks with you for a long, yeah. long time. Yeah. You never forget stuff like that. Yeah. Crazy, eh? Not really. Like, if you think about it, like, it's the person, people that have impact but on your But mind you, so that, if you have a good teacher, it sticks with you for a long time. But on the opposite end is, if you have a terrible teacher, that also makes a lasting impact on you. 100%. Hey. I got a couple, man. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. I was like, I, when I find myself... Like getting grumpy I'm like oh no 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 no! Don't be that Don't You know what that feels like You know What being in a class with a teacher Like I've had a teacher tell me Like I don't want you in my class Because I don't think you're going to be very good So can you find another class This was in high school Right So like <laughs> So I, I never went to I think it'd be very good She was like oh you're just not I wasn't like the other girls What were the other girls like? I want to say It was my design teacher Slutty. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> they, were just, they were like girls who went skiing in the holidays or went to Fiji. Oh, well off. Privileged. Yeah, and they like they had, so we had, it's when the Apple computers, you know those sort of clear ones, those with the big triangle looking yeah, back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they all had those at home, so they knew how to use them at school. We didn't. I didn't have one. So Popular. I, I used to always be like, oh, can someone help me? And she just got real. She was like, why don't you know how to use this? And I was like, but that's your job as a teacher to help me, like, figure this out. Wow. And I had really different design concepts because I, I had, like, a real, like, I was so interested in, like, being Samoan and trying to bring that into my designs. And she didn't really understand that about me. Right. So I think I, I, we just came from two different worlds, but she didn't really have the time to Try learn to about my world. Your yeah. One. So I used to go and hang out in the tourism class with all my mates and do all my design work there. Right. And she was really shocked that I, that I passed. She was like, oh, I didn't think you'd pass. Like, she said that to me. <laughs> and I was like, um... <laughs> wow. Yeah. So things like that. Yeah. And I had an English teacher who... I had... You know, in seventh form, you have your pack and save job at checkout. And she said, oh, is this what you're doing now? I said, no, I, I've... I got accepted into uni and she's like, did you? Oh my God. And I was like, yeah, this is just so I can have some like summer holiday money. Like this is not my life. How are you going to 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 judge a kid that's actually working, doing a job? Yeah. First off. Secondly, just to make the judgment that someone made it to uni. Yeah. And the did you, but now like COVID, check out people. They're essential workers. They're like. 100%. I learned so much. I think. Working checkout about people yeah. and interacting with people. Like, that was like, that schooled me on life, man. Mm. 
That was my first job too. Yeah. Uh, bagging. Oh yeah. <laughs> in Tonga, but I, not just not just bagging stuff, but having to like lift uh, like, sacks of sugar, sacks of yeah. flour to their cars and stuff. And it's but, like yeah, you do learn a lot about um, people, people. Hey, and how to interact with people and so many different people. Yeah. And the struggles people would go through. Like, you know, I'd feel so stink when people are like, oh, can you put that back? And you'd see all the kids. And I was like, oh, like. Wow. I had that happen to me last week. Really? Yeah, I had a lady, like, just next to me. Yeah. Put back, like, a, some stuff. But I looked at the stuff, and she had, like, about five or six kids with her. Yeah. It's just her. And she just, like, she just, like asked the lady just to take that off. Yeah. And that, that must have, like... I was like, man, I wouldn't... I ran it through. Oh, for her. She didn't know. She'd already left. But then I walked it out to her car, which was... Putting, putting her kids in, yeah. just gave it to her. But um, it only came to like 15, 16 bucks. None of it was alcohol. None of it was smokes. Yeah. It was like bread, It's milk, essentials, eh? And like for us, nappies. like only 15, 16 dollars. Yeah. But for some people, that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And that's... And I used to always like... I live such a charmed and privileged life that like working at checkout like really made me grateful for all the sacrifices my grandparents and parents made so that I wouldn't have to put things back you know mm. that I say like for me university that was just part of your education you go to uni but for some people they want to go but they can't because they have to like go to work to mm. support their family mm. like, if you had the choice again like to go back yeah would you go to uni would you still do that photography course? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Why? I think it's given me so, it makes me more interesting that, no offense to, my sister studied education for four years and she's a teacher too. Okay. And she's like, man, I wish I did what you did and studied something I loved and then did the postgrad teaching. It's like nice to have a different background to education. Just education. Yeah. Mm. But like, no disrespect to people that have done that. That's cool. Mm. But in my experience, talking to people that have different undergrads, mm. just and it, it sort of enriches your teaching. Mm. So I've got like my design and photography skills that I can bring into like making my classroom look really cool. <laughs> you do. I've seen some of your, <laughs> your classrooms. And just like teaching art, yeah. you know, because I've got that background knowledge. Yeah. And then in my syndicate, like... My team leader was like, well, if art's your passion and that's your background, like, what can you organise for our syndicate? Because she's like, not all of us are arty. Mm. And then other teachers, like, have, like, a drama background or a science background. And all those are their passions. Like, not necessarily did them at uni, mm. but they love it. So then that, like, you share it so you're not stuck in this bubble yeah. going, oh, I have to teach science, but I don't like it not very good at it but if there's another person at school that can do it like why not share it true true yeah but I think because um, you're talking about being enriched with having a different degree yeah but I think you're already a naturally quite a rich person before you're traveling and stuff as well you bring that perspective to it as well your experiences and I think being raised by my grandparents right like that was so different back in the 90s you're raised by your grandparents yeah that's interesting very. I lived such a. I was so spoiled. Yeah. I am spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so spoiled. it was just you and your grandparents. Yeah. In Palmerston North. Yeah. Right. So how, how a, did this come to be? So, I was born in Palmy, and then my parents got teaching jobs in Rotorua, so we moved there, and I I went to play centre. I went to Kohangareo there, and then I did. It, and then, I don't know. Why? But I ended up back in Palmy with my grandparents and I went to Aonga Amata. So this is all my early Aonga childhood. Aonga Amata, which is a Samoan... Language, learning nest, I guess. Is, this is pre-primary school? Pre-primary school. Yes. So I went, yeah, so I had, those were my ECE years. And then I started school in Rotorua. And then my parents separated and it was just me and my mum. And my dad moved... Um, I want to say he moved to Tauranga, but I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I just, sounds nice. <laughs> I just remember going to, yeah. Um, where he met my stepmom. Yes. 
And so I used to spend weekends and holidays there. Um, it's a beautiful place. It is. Mm. And then my mum got a job in Auckland teaching mm. at Point Chev. And for some reason, I was at my grandparents for the holidays. And like my nana was very, she just had upfront conversation. I was like seven, eight years old. And she's like, your mum's moving to Auckland. What do you want to do? <laughs> and, I was like, and I was like watching TV and I was like, I just want to stay with you. Like, wow. And she was like, okay. And that's how it happened. Wow. And that's how I like went back so to So you Pami. must have already had quite a close bond with your grandma. Well, I'm the firstborn grandchild on both sides. Very spoiled. So. <laughs> <laughs> I see. And on my mum's side, there's only two of us. Okay. So for a Samoan family, that's a really small family. And so your yeah, so. Have doted on you. Yeah, yeah, they did. And I was just, I lived such a beautiful, like when I look back, just anything, not so much that I wanted, but that I needed it was always there. Like, mm. I just thought it was normal to live with your grandparents until yeah. I went to a Palangi Catholic school and everyone was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, who's that old man waiting for you outside? Because my grandfather would pick me up from school and walk me home every day. Mm. And I was like, at the time, like, it was just, I thought everyone did that. And then when kids were like, no, I was like, oh. But now looking back, I was like, that's so special that I had that time with him. Mm. And he'd like bike, like without a doubt. He only missed it once and that's when he burnt down his garage. Wow. <laughs> he only missed picking us up once. But he sent the next door neighbour. <laughs> so wow. we still got picked up. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a pretty cool story. Yeah. It's... Because to you it's normal. It's, it's normal. It was normal. But like you go off obviously to school and... And then like pe- people didn't know. Where's your mum? Where's your dad? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but see, today I think it's quite normalised to have no- like yeah. two dads or two mums. Yeah, and like household. growing up in a blended family yeah. and yeah. growing up with my grandparents, I think makes me really relatable mm. to my kids because mm. they also have blended families, blended, blendy, blended families. Mm. Like, um, or some live with their grandparents for whatever reason, mm. and they're like, "Oh, there's someone else that's done it too," and I was like, "It's cool, eh?" And they're like, "Oh, yeah." <laughs> right, yeah. and then you moved from Palmy to Wellington, eh? Then my uh, then my mum moved to Samoa to teach. Right, and she said, "Do you want to come with me?" But I was settled in Palmy, so I was like, "No." <laughs> so you stayed in Palmy, and your mum went to Samoa. Yeah, she went there for a couple of years. She came back when I was about in high school. Okay. And then my nana was like, "Okay, you can live with your mum now," and I was like, "Why? <laughs> Why?" <laughs> wow. Yeah. And mum was like, "Come on," and I was like. Oh, okay. But it was really cool. You enjoy living with your mum? Um, it was really different from living with my grandparents who okay. were really, I wouldn't say they were strict. They just had rules that you yeah. followed. Yeah. And, and it was to keep me safe. Mm. Like rules are there to keep you safe, not mm. to like try and make you live your life a certain way. It's like for your safety. Like I had a great time living at my grandma. I'd like bike around the house. <laughs> My nana bought me a typewriter. I used to write stories. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it was just me, my grandparents, and my auntie moved in too. Right. So like grandparents, and like people like, who do you live with? And I was like, my grandparents and my auntie. Because I just thought that was normal. Like yeah. my family is my family. It doesn't have to be like That's right. the traditional mum and dad That's at right. home. I was like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because as long as it's my family and like literally a village raised me. Mm. So I think it's really important that we as adults play our role in the village to raise all our children together. That's right. Yeah. And so our communities should work. That, yeah. Yeah. They should. But sometimes it's idealistic though because some communities just don't, they break down for, yeah, or yeah. dysfunction for any, whatever reason. Yeah. Um, but your mum had less rules. Yeah. Right, right. I think. Was it just you and her? It was just me and her. Yeah. And I probably ran rings around her because she hadn't been around. You know? Okay. So I was like, I want to do it this way. Let's do this. And she just did whatever I wanted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, to the extent where she'd drive me up here to Auckland from Palmerston North because I wanted to see my cousins and go to the Otara markets. Wow. And she was like, okay. <laughs> That's a dream. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so was, I guess, yeah. I had a really good life compared mm. to a lot of people. Sure, sure. I can appreciate that. Yeah. Um, like, oh. it was unconventional. Yeah. 
but it was like I never felt the lack of love or safety. Like it's I, only unconventional in like the view of like certain people. You know what I mean? Colonial point of view. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> no, because some a lot of children grow up with like single parents mm. at home. Um, some kids don't even know some of their parents. Um, so it's only unconventional in that point of view. Yeah. But I guess the most you can ever hope for any child is that they're at least growing up in a place where they're loved and cared yeah. for. And that's like even... For some weird reason, people thought I didn't know my dad. Right. But he was always there for holidays. Mm. Like, he'd always come and get me or I'd go to Tauranga and, like, mm. my stepmom's family is my family. Mm. Like, I hate using the word stepmom. It's just mm. so... Separate. Like, it feels it's like cold. you're separating. Yeah, it's cold. a cold... Like, I've got heaps of mums. Like... Or people that I see as motherly figures to me and just for the, you know, mums have a, a sort of a wisdom that you need from time to time. Yes. And I'm lucky that I have like people that I can be like, can go to. Yeah. Yeah. The idea of what you said before about villages raising children, yeah. I think is more a cultural, almost indigenous yeah, idea absolutely. as well. It's one that's... Um, I think it's quite common amongst sort of Māori PEI, but yeah. not as well understood by Balangis. Yeah. Because theirs is more structured. Um, yeah. You're either part of our family or you're not. Yeah. Or, I, I could be wrong. I think that's changing probably as well. That's changing of the times. Yeah. Hopefully it is, because it'd be a good thing if it is changing for them. <laughs> <laughs> but like everyone has a role to play. Like you yeah. don't have to be good at everything because that's yeah. not how like our tūpuna lived. Yeah. Like everyone had their role to play and you... You just looked after everyone. Mm. Like nieces and nephews, they're all my kids. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. Like, yeah, my sister's baby, we call him our baby. Like all my siblings, where's our baby? Because he's ours. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, where you teach now, Yeah. Um, how do you find it? And what do you find challenging about it? Because you're telling me at the beginning how it can be challenging. Um... <laughs> I feel like <laughs> my story is different. <laughs> sure. <laughs> because um, every story is different, Alicina. Not just like living in a small, rural, isolated seaside community. Like it's beautiful. I, I moved to the Hokianga because when my koro passed away and we went to the Marae for his huimati, I just felt really not out of place. Like I, but I, I felt like a foreigner where I should have felt at home. Whereas in Whasamoa, I walk so confidently in Whasamoa that, like, I'm not used to not knowing what my role was. On not the used to feeling out of place. Yeah, I was at just a place like, where you should feel in yeah. place. And I was just like, this, the dis, like, I felt the disconnect, but I didn't know how to voice it. Mm. And so I just followed like my sister everywhere. And I was like, what should I be doing? What now? Like, and she was like, oh, just calm down. Like, but for me, in like Wellington. And my extended family, like, I know what my role is. I know what my duties are. Right. And, like, you know, you just, when, when you get the call from your aunties, you just go and you get to work. But then I got to my marae and I was like, I shouldn't feel like this on my marae. And I, I just, I was like, oh, like, felt useless. And I didn't right. know anyone. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, that's your auntie, that's your cousin, that's your uncle. But I was like, but I don't, I've never seen them before. <laughs> like, I don't know them. So it was more in search of your own identity. It was like reconnecting a to a yeah. place that I should feel like is my home. Like, you know, I should feel normal because all my siblings, they grew up on the marae and they, they, they knew what to do. They knew their role. And I was just like, oh. And people were like to my dad, do you have another daughter? Because I was just never seen. I was never right. there. Right. I went to the Hokianga to swim, go to the gigs at the tavern and then go back down to Wellington. So Like, like a tourist. Yeah. Yeah. I was like a tourist in my own home. Mm. So I made that, that was like a, in a, something inside when I went back to Wellington, I was like, oh, like I felt that call, the need to go back and learn. Because I was doing things like I'd ring my dad and I was like, oh, what's that pepeha thing again? What's my one? Can you tell me? Yeah. You feel and, awkward doing that. Yeah. And I was just, I felt bad because I should know all this stuff. And then I was like, I was like, what's that thingy, that mihi thingy again? Can you just tell me like one more time? Right. And he, he was like, you... You need to live it to learn it. And he'd always say that to me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But can you just tell me because I've got to go and do a mihi? <laughs> or I just want to look cool in front of everyone because I'll have a mihi, like, you know. And he'd always say, like, you need to live it to learn it. 
I really appreciate your honesty about it. Because it's, no, it's something that I think a lot of people feel, yeah. but don't necessarily voice yeah. or talk about or even list, do something about. Yeah, so I'm, like, it took me a whole year mm. because I had to sort of talk my mum into it. Not talk her into it, but just... Get her used to the idea. Get, yeah, because I've always lived close to her. Sure. Um, and she was actually really supportive. Sorry, you're her only child, is that right? Yeah. Wow, oh, it's a massive yeah. thing for her. Yeah. yeah. So, and she was just like, I understand, you need to do what you got to do. Yeah. And I said, you know, I've got like two really strong cultures, mm. but not that one dominated, but I should feel, you know, a balance between the two. Or not just, I, don't, I just felt like <laughs> so useless on the marae. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> Māori and Samoan are two very, very beautiful, strong cultures. And so different. Yeah, like, and we live in Aotearoa. Different. And if yeah. you are Māori, probably the least you'd want to do is, like at least I assume, because I'm not Māori, yeah. is get to know it and yeah. understand it and feel it. And just live it. Like, my, mm. like I was like, oh. So I, I, it took me a year, Wellington. I packed all my stuff up in a van. Is it scary? Yeah. Mm. Um. Because I've never been away like that far away from my mum before. Oh well, well you when have. She, no, you have I, physically, I, yeah. but you've never done that emotional. Yeah. Yeah. And I think because when she came back from Samoa, like we we were, became really really close. Because when I was living in Palmy and I moved to Wellington, she was living in Palmy, and then she moved to Wellington, mm. like a year after I left. So she was still close, and also the physical distance between my nana, like that's probably the the furthest I've ever been away from her. Wow. Um, but I moved in my in this van, one van, because my dad's like a minimalist almost. Right. He's like, don't bring all your stuff, because I probably, I, I had way too much stuff. How old are you at this time? <sighs> 29. Mm. Picked up the van. My cousin was like, do you want someone to travel with you? I was like, okay. So she jumped in. We drove to Auckland. She flew back because she had to work the next day. Mm. And then um, I actually got really sick. <laughs> I got gastro. <laughs> and I, lucky Here my, in Auckland, in on Auckland. your way to go up north. No, 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 in Auckland. And I was like, I'm dying. And lucky, like, my sister and my brother lived here. And my sister was, like, like looking after me. And she's like, I've actually got to go to work. So just oh. die a little bit quietly while I'm at work. <laughs> and then I had to ring my brother. And I was like, can you just drive me the rest of the way up? And he was like, I have to drive a van. And I was like, please. And he did. Then we like unpacked it in the garage and we had to turn around and bring the van back because it was a hired van. <laughs> it's oh, okay. Auckland. Okay. Yeah. So that was like, it was massive. Like when I think about it, I'm like, I can't believe I did that. It is massive. Like just listening to it. It's because yeah. you're literally like picking up everything that you own, everything that you've known as well is yeah. about to change. Yeah. And, and I didn't really know anyone up north. And you're about to step into. A place that I should know. Well, children's lives. Yeah. About to step into all these children's lives. They don't know you. Yeah. And but I went in with the mentality of, I made sure that I was going up north, not with like, I know all this stuff because I'm from the city. I went with the mentality of, I'm open to learn. Humble. Yeah. Because otherwise I was like, oh, I've seen it before. Like when people are like, oh, I know everything because I'm from the city and city people know everything and just been chased out, you know. So you didn't turn up a dickhead? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I had to like be even more, I like, not how, oh, I don't know, not quiet, but because my dad's the principal. So then I had to learn how to become the principal's daughter in a small community. Damn. And that's like, you the have pressure. to. Because. Um, because not only like for me as a teacher, like you need to. Hold yourself in a certain way. Yeah, you can't just be a normal human, you know? So, like, when I go out to the pub or stuff, like, I don't get too wasted because I'm worried. Like, I still have to, like, so right. be a respectable person of the community because parents are at the pub too. And I don't want them to be like, oh, my God, that's, like, what my child goes to school to. Of course. Um, and And also, like, when you're the principal's daughter, everyone's not waiting for you to, like... <laughs> Screw up. Yeah. So I, I, and so I'm, I'm. Kind of like being a minister's daughter. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. 
But I, I take it really like all my siblings grew up as the principal's kids. Right. So they knew what it was like. And I was the only one that hadn't experienced it because I lived down with my mum. And I, I sort of had an inkling of what it was going to be like, but mm. it's not like I had to jump through so many hoops just to apply and get the job that I have. Right. I actually didn't get the job <laughs> that wow. I applied for. Like I had to reapply for another position. That's an amazing truck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are in a garage, not yeah. a studio. <laughs> so that, that humbled me up real quick because people in Wellington were headhunting me. They were like, we want you at our school. And meanwhile, I'm up here <laughs> interviewing, writing like long as cover letters, going just through my CV. Just so, yeah, because my dad's really transparent. He's a process person. Right. And he need, he's like in this community. Like, when, like, if anyone questions it, we need to show them this is the process that we took. Like, you didn't. There's no nepotism when it comes to my dad. And I was like, please. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's very, like, transparent as and really open and honest as well. And I was like, oh, man, can you just be my dad every now and then? Well, that's what every community needs, obviously. Yeah. Though, someone like that. Yeah. Especially if they're in a position like that as well that the community looks up to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <sighs> You said you're trying, they were trying to headhunt you down in Wellington. Yeah, because people wanted me at their schools. Difference of pay and what you're getting offered down in Wellington. Yes. To <laughs> Absolutely. I just assumed that. Yeah, Yeah, because so they wanted me in well. like yeah. management. People wanted me to be syndicate or DP. And I was like, i got to go home. Deputy principal. Yeah. You're getting deputy principal offers. Yeah. Or like people like, they'll suggest, they're like, hey, this has come up at my school. Perhaps you'd like to apply for it. And I was like, no, oh, yeah, cool, nah. Because Very set on what you wanted to do. Yeah, mm. yeah. And it's... So let's just say like you couldn't get a job at your dad's school. Yeah. What would you have done? I was... Because that's... My dad said there's... At the time that I made that decision and I was there's like, I'm coming up, I'm coming home. <laughs> and he was like, well, there's no jobs at my school. And I said, it doesn't matter. I was like, I'll work at the cafe, I'll work at the pub. Like I could even drive to Kitty Kitty and work at the surf shop. Like I just wanted to move home. Wow. So for me, I was just grateful that a position did come up and then I applied for it and they were like, <laughs> sorry, you didn't get it. And I was like, okay, well, then I better go and look for other jobs. And then a second one came up a little bit later and I was like, okay. I, I, then I hummed in hard because I was like, oh, maybe it's a sign. I'm not meant to teach there. Maybe there's another school that'll want me. But I applied and got it. <laughs> wow. But man, the interview process like was hard out. <laughs> like Thorough. Really, really thorough to the point where I was like, do I actually want this job? Right. And like I, I, like I went in with gusto and then by the end of it, I sort of fizzled out and I was like, oh, maybe it's not for me. Like, and so I was just like, oh, yeah, like whatever. I would have thought in rural Northland that it's hard to find school teachers. It is. So it please really explain is. to me why the interview process is so hard and thorough. I think because, I, because I was the principal's daughter. <laughs> like... Okay. That's, I was just yeah. like, oh, I was like sweating. <laughs> like, Damn. Yeah. What was hard about it? Just like the, qu the questions. Like some of them, I, I, I found myself saying, can you say that again? <laughs> like, what sort of questions? Just like, how would you integrate? Uh, um, how would you localize the curriculum? How would you integrate? Like, because it's an area school, so it's year one to 13. And I hadn't had that kind of experience before. I've only taught intermediate. Because that's, I love that year. Like, mm. people hate that year, but that's my year group, man. Okay. Because that's, that's the year that children are sort of transitioning. It's that transition high year. They're, 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 they're more, they're strong in who they think they are, you know? Starting to question things. They, they question things, but still, you can still keep them in line, you know, and just pull them up. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, actually, that was pushed you a bit too far. But I just like that. When they come in really quiet as year sevens, by the time they leave me as year eights, man, I was like, whoa. I was like, the future is bright. <laughs> right. Yeah. Their confidence. Like, yeah. It's a boost, eh? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I can't imagine myself teaching lower. I've taught year five and six. That was the initial job that I got. Is <laughs> how old, sorry? They're like nine and ten. Okay. Ten, eleven-ish. Yeah. Just before um. Just before intermediate, yeah. Um, so once you got the job. Yeah, so I got the job, did my classroom. Actually, no. <laughs> so my dad takes me to the school. Because I'm like, oh, I want to see my classroom. Like, you know, 
It'll be so cool. And he takes me and he like unlocks this door and it like creaks. It's a sliding door. He used to like push it. And he goes, here you go. And I was like, okay, so where's my real classroom? I was like, funny dad. So funny. Where's my classroom? And he's like, this is it. And I was like, no, it's not. And he was like. What was wrong with the classroom? Oh, my God. Like, I felt like I'd been time walked into 1970. <laughs> like, right. It was like, no, it was just. I didn't want to cry, but I was just like, you're joking. Can you describe for me, like, what you saw? It was, no. <laughs> it, was, it was so, the windows, like, didn't even shut at the top. So when it rained, the rain would come through. Mm. Um, there were so many layers of paper stapled to the wall. It took me a whole day to get to the actual wall, <laughs> like, because I had to pull. There was, like, sheets, and I took the sheets down. And then behind that was like coloured paper and I took the coloured paper behind and then behind that was like wallpaper and behind that there was more coloured paper and behind that was black. So it took me a whole day to like actually strip it bare right. down to the original wall, which was coming away a little bit. <laughs> like, wow. Um, like radiator heaters. I was like, what is this? Like I've come from schools with heat pumps. Wow. I had no digital technology in my classroom. What year is this? This is like 2018. I was like, oh, so where are all the Chromebooks? Where are the iPads? Where is my class PC? And he was like, um... <laughs> I was like, where's my projector or my interactive whiteboard? Like, this is what I've come from. Mm. Why are you giving me? It was a chalkboard and a whiteboard. <laughs> so... Damn. Um, um, what decile is the school? Oh, when, like, you, when you got there? We're like... Negative one. <laughs> 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 so we're actually a turnaround school which means the Ministry of Education works really closely because it's just so... Right. So, yeah. Just like a Desire One. Yeah, I think Desire Ones in the city are way better resourced. Right. Because like, you're living in the far north. There's no one around. Like, or it take It's... They're so far away. Yeah. That, like, in Wellington, I'm used to, like... I can yes. email someone and the next day they'll just drive in from the city, you know? But there... I'm like, oh, they're either in Whangarei, which is two hours away, or Auckland, which is a four-hour drive away. Wow. So it was, it was, yeah, but not having any technology in my classroom, for me, I was like, oh, my God, like, I have to dig deep and give these kids what they deserve, which is, like, education mm. and modern-day education without all my fancy gadgets that, mm. like, I put my big... Shows on with, <laughs> like, right. it was literally just me. Stripped, it kind of strips you right back into the, the essentials of being a teacher and yeah. what a teacher does. Yeah, I and I was like, "Where's the resource room?" And he's like, mm. "Don't have one." And he's like, "Oh, you just go around the other classrooms and look for what you need." <laughs> and I was like, "You're joke, you are joking." Like, <laughs> no wonder why he was like, "Are you sure you want to move up here?" Yeah, and I was like, "How, how has the Ministry of Education let this?" be because it was the norm like everyone was like oh yeah they just went with it and I was like no like these kids like because they're so far away we should be at the top of ICT and integrating digital technology what's ICT? I'm um, like using your Chromebooks and, oh okay yeah yeah okay like digital technology this yeah but they weren't mm. I was like <laughs> so I used to always like I was that teacher that always went to the office and I was like, the roof's leaking, the window. I was like, it's too hot in my classroom because we don't even have a fan and it gets so hot. Like mm. after lunch, we were just dying and mm. I'd try and read to the kids and I'd, they'd practically fall asleep and mm. I was falling asleep because it was like <laughs> yeah. being in the islands. Except in Sabo, you have fans in your classroom and I had nothing. <laughs> right. Far out. It reminds me so much of primary school in Tonga. Yeah. And we were like, we'd sit on the floor, concrete floors. Do you know, it was like your garage floor. Like, I went and got a mat for my classroom. Wow. <laughs> wow. So I bought things like bean bags, like, to make it cool and modern. Mm. I spent, like, heaps of money that summer. Your own money? Classroom. Yeah. You're in the far north. You've been there for a few years. Yeah. Have you been around many other schools? Or do you know, do you interact much with any other schools around the far north? Yep. Is this similar? Ah, uh, No. <laughs> I was like, man, I chose the wrong Shit. school. <laughs> like, I think you did. I was no. like, what is this? <laughs> nah, yeah, no. Like the Kuda, rec the Kuda recently had a new build and their building is beautiful, like amazing. What is Brand new. And I was like, why, why who does Who is this? smoking the funds of your primary school? I was school? like, who is the person that sits in the office in Wellington or wherever 
that like decides, you know, important things like our classrooms. Like mm. our classrooms are so. But by the end of the year, after all my <laughs> frequent visits and complaints about like my kids need this, my kids that we finally got a heat pump and a projector, and then they moved me into another classroom. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you start from scratch again. <laughs> So you set it up for someone else to come yeah. in and... Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh. Right. But then I was like, oh, you just roll with the punches. Yeah. And I think it's a good thing for the kids to see, like, we don't have nothing, but yeah. we just make do with what we've got. Yeah. But at the same time, right, how do I advocate for these kids mm. so that they get the classroom environment that they deserve? But also the other thing as well, sometimes I forget as well, is that because um, kids don't necessarily know what they're what they could get. Yeah. They get used to that's right. what's that's available. Right. That is so and right. And so that's all they know. And so they um, they value it. Yeah. But if something else is given to them, then of course they yeah. it's extra value. But when children like don't have much, they become accustomed to it and they just yeah. adjust to it and they get used to this being the norms. Yeah. Um, and so like I was that person, I was like, do you like this budget stuff? And they're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, you deserve the best. Like, you know, I was like, my kids deserve what every other kid in New Zealand has. Like, cool, like, practical things and nice things. I was like, you guys deserve nice things. Mm. Just because you live in the WAPs doesn't mean, like, you have to sit on hay bales. No, we don't do that. We're not that far. But, like, you know, <laughs> that'd be heavy as. Yeah, I, I imagine so, yeah. Um, what sort of backgrounds do your kids come from? What's it like up there? It's lots of farm kids. So school for them is like, it's a time to socialise, you know, because they, they, live in, they live so far apart. It's not like the city. You can just walk down to your mate's house or jump on the bus and, you know, go to the mall with your friends. They don't have those sorts of interactions with Some of them another. live quite far apart. They live like a 20-minute school bus right away, or if not more. So, like, you know, they just come to school to hang out. So for me, I'm like, okay, so how can we like build that manakitanga and mm. hang out, but then like incorporate it to our, into our learning? So, you know, they're actually here for their learning as well. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't give you an answer to that. I'm still <laughs> no, 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 working no. it out. <laughs> Are all of them from farms? No, 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 no. So we've got like a little township, which is like, we've got two dairies, yeah. a petrol station, a fish and chip shop and a pizza shop. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but so the, you'll find them at the wharf hanging out, which I love that life for those kids, for yeah. my kids, not those kids. Quite idyllic, eh? Yeah. Yeah. And, but you can see in the, like in the age of technology, they, they're like, it's not enough for them because they can see now what other people are doing. Ah. You know, with heaps of my kids. Social media. Have, yeah, social media. And I'm like, man, you guys have a really good life here. Don't ever doubt that just because you haven't seen it on like not everyone Instagrams about it or, you know, your influencers or your TikTok influencers don't have the same life as you. Like you still really have a good, good life. How has social media affected that age group? Because that's the age group that you specialize yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, How's that changed over the last few years? I have to like keep with the times. Right. Because <laughs> like things that I think are cool. Right. They're just like, what are you going on about? And I was like, oh my God, I actually am old. <laughs> I'm like, oh man. Like when TikTok first hit my class, I banned it. For, like if I was like, if I hear any of those videos or if I see you on your phone, that's it. I'm taking your phone for the rest of the day. Hold I don't on. want They're it. They're allowed their phones in class. Uh, in my class, yeah. Right. Yep. Um, sure. And then... I went to Wellington for Christmas and all my friends were on TikTok. So I jumped on it and I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> so now I use it for research purposes <laughs> to learn, like to understand what kids are talking about. So now you're a TikTok queen. I, I wouldn't say I was a queen, but <laughs> I, I'm like a little bit addicted when I first got onto it. But like, man, they just, their lingo and like when the references now, I can understand what's going on in class. So I, yeah. I'll be like, that's inappropriate because I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And they're like, oh, sorry, fire. So I was like, oh man, like you actually have to, you can't, I, I shouldn't have banned it when I did. You can't yeah. block it. Yeah, 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 and I'm not yeah. saying like join in on it, but just be aware of it. Like yeah. be aware so that you can have those conversations with the kids yeah. and to make sure that they're like, they're good digital citizens, really. Yeah. That's what, that's what I want. world. It is. 
like insane and like man yeah social media if i could get rid of it i would mm. <laughs> but it's just does it affect the age group at all in a negative way yeah absolutely right yeah i've heard of classrooms in america where they spend most of mondays yeah um uh, resolving what happened on social media in the weekends yeah it's like there's a then that's another fine line right of what happens out of school I heard that statement, but I didn't really understand what it meant because what does what do the age group do to each other on weekends they and social just, media? What sort of stuff? They're like keyboard warriors, man. Bullying. Like, yeah, or just like saying all the... And I'm like, but in real life, like some of my most beautiful girls, like they're so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> and then I'll... Um, different people on social media. So different. Far out. And I don't go looking for it. Yeah. Other students will be like, oh, did you see this? And I'll be like, who is that? That's, that's not the person that's been in my class for the last three years like totally different persona so it's like making sure that in my teaching you know I really try and teach our school values like be respectful not to other people but to yourself as well catching trolls when they're young yeah it's great like I was like man I grew up in a really good era I'm glad that there was no social media or mm. we were just coming into MSN <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> MSN that. when you had like capital letter little letter when you were writing your name yeah. and stuff like that I was like, yeah, MSN was enough. I don't think I'd be able to cope as a teenager today. Yeah. So is it like comments and stuff on each other's pictures? Yeah, but even the pictures. I was like, mm, oh. do you dress like that at school? No. Oh. Do you dress like that like in front of your parents? Provocative. A little bit, yeah. Or like boys trying to be tough. And I was like, but you're my loveliest boys. Like, since when did you try and beef everyone out? Like, mm. what is this? Your life is manus and bombs off the wharf. Why yeah. are you trying to be like an HP boy and... Yeah. It's interesting, eh? It's the yeah. influence of what they see that they yeah. feel that they should be. Yeah. And therefore they start to like change who they are. Yeah. Hmm. So that's, yeah, that's part and parcel. But I think your original question was, <laughs> sorry. No, 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 you're right. Was like, when I made the move up, some of the challenges and one of my biggest challenges was making friends. With the students or with other with actual with other people? other adults right. in the community. Because it's already quite a small community. It's a small community. I'm Where an outsider. I'm the principal's daughter. So for me, I was the person that... I was the one who put the barriers up. So right. I was like... You're from the city. I, I was the one that was like, oh, I can't actually make friends because... I can't make friends with my work colleagues because my dad's their boss. You made the excuses to yourself. Yeah. So, you know, when people were trying to be friendly, I'd just... I'd be friendly... And polite, yeah. but wouldn't really get to know them because I didn't want to put them in any awkward situations, you know? like What's an awkward situation? <laughs> you know, when you're work, with your workmates and you like, if you have issues with your boss, you just talk shit about your boss. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I do know what you mean, yeah. Because that's, that's what you do. That's the, yeah. your friendship banter. Like, you don't mean it, but it's just like, ah, da 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 I roll, I roll. Yeah, Little like, vent. you know. And I didn't want to, you know, if someone had a bad day with the boss who was also my dad, I didn't want to be... The person that they had to like censor themselves because you're yeah, there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And at the same time, if I'm having a bad day with my boss, who's also my dad, yeah. I was like, I can't really vent because at the I'm end of the daughter. day, he's my dad. And yeah. I like, you know, so it was bridging those kinds of gaps. Or I don't know. So how did you bridge those kind of gaps? I... Have you or have you not? <laughs> like I, I've made good friends but it took me a really long time to trust them. Yeah. And they were just so patient. And that they're, they're friends, but like, so I, when I was like building up those barriers, they sort of came in as mentor because they were like, oh, she's building up barriers to like protect us. <laughs> um, so they, then they sort of took, we sort of started our journey as like more of a mentoring journey. Mm. And now like we're good friends, like three years later. Like I was right. like, man, you got good people that for three years you've worked on just making sure that I was okay. As yeah. a person. Yeah. Well, it's um, quite an important thing because especially when you're in a small community. Yeah. Like where it travels so yeah. fast. And so literally my, my life is school, home, the beach, walking my dog and that's it. <laughs> and so when do I, you have people that you vent to? Friends that you can vent yeah, to? You yeah. You can. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I live on the teacher compound, which is also different. So there's the school houses. Yes. So I live at the front on the principal's house and on either side school teachers live on. Right. Live beside me. Right. And behind me are two other school houses. And then behind that is a row of school flats for teachers. So we live on the compound. <laughs> All the kids walk past, drive past, too. 
hi, miss, because my, my dick, like, faces out to the road. And so I'm like... So you I can't even, like, drink on my like, dick because... You can't even drink on your dick. Well, you, I, like, we do, but I always have my back to the road because for some reason I feel like I can't be seen drinking, which is strange because mm. the kids, like, know I drink. Mm. But not... I guess they haven't seen me the way they've seen other adults. Right. And, yeah. But you don't mind them seeing you on the podcast now? Yeah, no. Because yeah. <laughs> they know. They're not. Yeah, but also there's a thing to be said about treating them maturely as well. Yeah. And not just always trying to... Um, and ha- creating this illusion as yeah. well. And then I, like, because then I'm of two minds, like, oh, yeah, they should be able to see me have, like, a drink with, mm. you know, dinner. Or, like, if my whole family's having dinner and a wine, it should be fine. Yeah. But, like, I don't come from a family of, like, raging party party mm. people so <laughs> right i think they always wait for it right but just we're very conservative chill yeah i don't know if we're conservative we're just it's probably a strong word yeah we're really chill mm. yeah oh that's good yeah i like to think that i'm like the party person but one of my brothers probably is more so <laughs> he lives in dunedin he's a student in dunedin so it's party central yeah yeah um Looking after your kids, like when you take them on, take on like a class, because it's a different class every year, is that right? Yeah, or like I'll have them for year seven and eight. Yeah. So for two years two I'll years. have them. Yeah. So what sort, of, what sort of journey do you go on with these kids over that year or two years? Like how closely do you get to know them? What's and their it like? families? Like get to know their families Getting to know well. families. Um, it's, you know, it's a... When I taught in Wellington, because we, we kept them for two years, and I was like, man, I see these, these little people. They're not little at all, but, you know, in my mind, they're like <laughs> small. Babies. They're like babies. Um, I see them every day for two years, and then after two years, they're gone. You, let, and you have to let go of them. And I have to, like, that was new learning for me, was letting go, because mm. I wasn't used to that feeling. Because you build up such, you, you see them, you, they, you are there when things are good in their lives and you are there when things are bad and they're there when you know the same happens to you and I'd have like sometimes I'd come to class and I'd be like look someone just passed away in my family so today I might be a little bit quiet but sad and they get it they get it so for two years you build up like those relationships with them and then I have to let them go into year nine Mm. like in Wellington because they'd go into different high schools and just hope for the best. I was like, oh, mm. <laughs> good luck. I hope I've like taught you enough life skills to just get out there and get things done. Like, because for me, I just always want my kids to be better than I ever was. Yeah. You know, and to achieve far greater and higher things than I have. But I'm not finished achieving things. So I always say, I always say to them, like, I'm not finished. So you're not finished. Yeah. Yeah. Very <laughs> and cool. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. But that's, yeah, that for me, like letting go, letting go. Yeah. Because then I, I think I took on that like mama bear persona, like, oh, I hope my kids are okay. But then they'd always come back. Mm. Like they'd come back in year nine, they'd come back in year 10, all throughout their high school years because, you know, when they have exams, they finish earlier. So they'd always come back. And the rule was, I was like, like, this classroom gave you a lot, so what are you going to give back when you come back to class? Like, I don't want you to be annoying and just, like, play around and loiter. Mm. Like, what are you going to give back to this classroom? Yeah. That apparently, they were like, these were the best years of my life. I was like, so how can you make that environment for the kids that I have now? And they'd come back, I'd have boys come and read with, like, my lower readers. Right. And that was like, man, kids That's learning. Cool. It was cool. It was yeah. really, really cool. And I was just really grateful that they'd come back because I never asked them to come back. They'd just be like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you need to sign in, make sure it's okay with the principal and then you can come and help. Yeah. Yeah. And it was cool for my younger kids, or younger, the ones that were in my classroom to see that, like, like I can always come back here. She'll always, like, the doors, it's like open door. And that's once you great. walk into my classroom as a student, that's it, you're mine forever. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how old you get, I'll always see you as 12. And I oh. always say that to them. Um, we spoke before about um, uh, life of a school teacher probably normally extends beyond 
yeah. at the school gates. What sort of things does that mean for you? Um, and I'm sorry I'm speaking so stilted. <laughs> <laughs> it means like when I'm not at school, I'll, I'll be thinking of school. Um, COVID sort of caught me out a little bit because I thought I was doing really well with online learning. And, uh, but then I didn't realise like how, how often I was online and how contactable I was. Like I didn't have my normal 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. hours that I'd do at school. It was like 24, like I felt like I was on wow. all the time because some, like for kids, they, they couldn't always get on between the hours of like 8 and 3, which were normal school hours. Like they'd have to come on a bit later or parents would finish work or whatever they were doing and come on and be like, can you help? Like we need extra help. And I just felt like I had to always be there. Damn, okay. I never thought about that. Yeah, but of course parents so like are working I, at home online. Yeah. Use the, probably the one laptop or the one yeah, computer that's right. in the house. And so kids would come on after their parents would be finished. So I'd have like in the some, evening? Yeah. And so, like, I was kids. always... <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. But that's me. Same. Like, I wouldn't. And you, like, I, <laughs> I probably only had about three okay. that always were online. Wow. But for some kids, like, they didn't see anyone for ages. So, like, I felt like I had to be yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Or I had to have something for them. And then parents that would contact me. And grandparents that would contact me. And then, so I just felt like I always... I felt that was my duty as a teacher at that time to always be there, like it was my job, I had to. And then I couldn't shut it off when we came back to school. Right. Like I, it was like, I felt like I had to keep going. And so I worked all through the holidays. Doing? Schoolwork, like just getting ready for the next. And just in case we go into lockdown, like I have to make sure that things are ready to go. Wow. And I couldn't stop it. Like I couldn't turn it off. Like to right. the point of like I just got so exhausted that I was on the brink of beginning to burn out. Have you turned it off these summer holidays? Yeah. Okay. I should turn them back on, but I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen like teachers at school in the school car park yeah. and I was like. Just drive past. <laughs> you I'm do you, boo. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise I, I, yeah. I do feel a little bit guilty that I'm not at school. You feel guilty that you're not at school? Yeah. Because I feel like I should be preparing for my kids to come back home. I mean to school. <laughs> Wow, you see yeah. that little mistake you just <laughs> made right there? Yeah. Wow. Like I should be making sure that everything is in place and in order so that they are happy to be back and, that, you know, to get that feeling of excitement. Mm. But at the moment I'm just, I think I'm still a little bit tired, but I think this, this summer break, like teachers have really, really needed it. Mm. Or all teaching staff. It's like, and we really needed to break, but my mum's, my mum's always, she's just like, makes resources all the time. She's like, do you like this? So I'm trying to not think about school, whereas she's like at the table making things. And she's like, do you want this for your classroom? And I'm like, yep. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it, it doesn't turn off because I'll, I'll go to like museums and I'm like, how can I incorporate this into my classroom learning? Or like, how can I get my kids out here so that we can have a school trip? Um, or like meeting people and I'm like how can I get them to like come into my class and be a guest speaker you're always thinking about it yeah that means you're passionate about it I do I do actually yeah. I've learned like because I was like oh yeah teaching it's yeah. cool it's all good but I feel like at this point in time of my life this is my purpose like it might not be my purpose forever but at the moment it makes sense and it's my purpose. It's satisfying. It is. It really is. Do kids contact you as well when they're, something's going on at home or they're going through things? Do you mean while they're in my class? When they're out of your class. Like, but as a student of mine. When they're a student of yours. Or so, does it... Uh, so, like, we'll have a conversation. Yeah. Um, and then I, like... Like, when we had a school counsellor, like, I'd... I'd Refer them. Refer them. Yeah. When you had a school counsellor, yeah. you don't have a school counsellor. Not at the moment. Right. We're trying to find one. But school counsellors, man, massive job. Yeah. It's so important. Like, I think kids need school counsellors and I But they need honestly, good school counsellors. Yeah, good yeah. ones. And I think, to be honest, I think counselling should be part of, like, every term, teachers, it should be compulsory for, te like, to offer counselling to teachers. 
I thought about this a lot while you were talking. Yeah. Because a lot of the stuff that you talk about is quite in depth. And stuff that, because you said to me as well, that stuff that's not taught at teacher's training college no. as well. But so the amount of stuff that you take on. Yeah. Um, I guess everyone's got different ways of offloading that. Yeah. Um, but if it's not offloaded in the right way, then like cops have counsellors, obviously, because yeah. they deal with a lot of stuff. Yeah. But um, I never underestimate what's the sort of stuff that teachers come across as well. And that teachers hear as well about what happens at home. Yeah. Because kids will just say stuff and kids are honest. Yeah, they are. They're so, I love kids. They're yeah. so honest. Yeah. Like blatantly cutthroat or <laughs> honest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's just who they are. Yeah. You know, and, and you're right. Like, and sometimes they, they don't, like adults, adults don't tell you when they're not okay. They just try and like work through it. But then something snaps and they might, do something that you're like that's not in their character and so I'll just like pull them aside and I'll be like what's on top for you because like asking like how are you or what's wrong those are really difficult questions to answer even as an adult like what's wrong oh where do I start but I usually say like what's on top what's on the top of your mind right now right and they'll, they'll say this 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 and like if I think that I can support them through it I will but if I think it's bigger than me then that's when we do like referrals to the, so we've got a, some schools have school counsellors or like um, a Swiss worker, which is social worker in school, if it's like really big. What are some of the common problems? We're not obviously naming any names or anything, but what are some of the common problems that you come across? Um, kids, like kids that get moved, like have to move. Or family situations, like maybe like a divorce or separation. Right. Or someone who's maybe passed away suddenly. Um, maybe a family member gets like a terminal illness, things like that. Mm. Um, like, I'm trying to think, maybe family violence. Um, right. Or, or Fano members, like using drugs. Like drug usage. A lot of drug usage in the Northland? I want to say there isn't, <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, yeah. There is. Yeah. I just want to say there isn't because I want to be like. Let's just, let's just <laughs> clarify. When we I talk, when you're saying drugs though, like what sort of drugs? Marijuana? Yep. Yeah. Um, in the far north, like I've never seen it myself, but pee is quite prevalent. Right. But I've seen, like, you know, you'll be sitting at the cafe and, like, you'll know when someone's on the fries because they just don't look, like, their whole ahua doesn't look, they don't look right. Right. Um, but Any yeah. of this, how does, how does this affect, like, the children that come through to you? It's just normalised. They think it's normal. You're kidding. They're just like, oh, yeah. They know it's not good, but they're just like, oh, yeah. Like, it's not, it's not anything. Whereas me, when I grew up, because I grew up with my grandparents. Right. And right. my parents are like super straight. That's so straight. Like <laughs> they don't even, they do know now, but like when I was a teenager, they didn't really know about, or like I never had conversations about drugs with my mom. Like yeah. She doesn't, she yeah. was like, what, yeah. what's that? Like not what's drugs, but when I was like, well, oh yeah. definitely a he's very like, dangerous one. Yeah. <sighs> So, like, when I was taking year nine science, I tried to, you know, because they're, like, 13, 14, and they're talking, like, you know, starting to have, like, house parties and just, like, I was like, alcohol is a drug. <laughs> like, they were like, oh, man, this lady, she's talking about beers being a drug. And I was like, it is, though. Sure. So I was like, so if that's, like, and they're like, oh, they're like, miss, you're so funny. Because <laughs> I, I'm like, don't drink, it's bad for you. Trying to mother them. Yeah, but yeah. trying to... Give them facts. Yeah. Like, and not, not be like, oh, don't drink because you'll get hurt. Be like, look, these are facts. Your brain's still growing. Yeah. I was like, and I'd show them like diagrams and pictures and studies. I was like, I'm not making this up yeah. to be like, oh, don't drink. It's bad. Yeah. It's bad because of this. I was like, mm, 18, 19. Like, even your brain stops growing when it's like 23. Yeah. So if you start too early, what are you doing to your... So we have conversations like that. Yeah. And they're like, oh, oh, yeah. Gives them a different perspective on it. Yeah, them. that's right. Because the media like makes it out that it's really cool. Yeah. It's always um it's our alcohol sold. Yeah. It's like marketers really cool. Yeah. It's 
for summer, it's for grown ups, it's what people do for fun. Yeah. To market like, it like that. If you drink, you'll be like this rapper or this yeah. social media influencer. And I was like, they don't actually drink it, they just hold it for the photo. <laughs> That's right. Um, what's not marketed though is methamphetamine. Yeah. And uh, I guess what I'm trying to ask is how prevalent do you think it is? Like how much of these children have like come into contact with it or like seen I couldn't really tell you how yeah, much yeah, yeah, so yeah. like for me, I think it's really important that you offer them other avenues so that if they do if they're exposed to it, they have things like kapaka to fall back on. You know? They have things like wakama. Different outlets. A different yeah. And so if they're strong in their identity and who they are, then they're like Oh, not for me. Mm. Like, you know, because if you're training for kapaka, because man, you need to be fit to mm. be singing and performing mm. and a wakama. Like, that's like, you need to be fit and you need to have that mental ability, you know? Switched on. Switched on, alert, strong mind. Sure. And I always say, you know, the drugs and alcohol, that clouds you. Sure. Some people still get addicted to it, though. Yeah. But, uh, and the kids love wakama. Mm. They love it so much. Like the boys especially, they love it. And my dad runs Wakama, so they always like, all the boys that hang outside the principal's office and the regulars in the principal's office also love Wakama. So I was like, oh, it's really nice that they have like a positive reason to be there. Right. And they're waiting for him. They're always like, miss, is your dad here? Like, (laughs) I was like, he's gone to change, but he'll be back soon. And so like, no one wants to miss out. Your dad sounds like a rock star up in the he's, community. <laughs> He'd prefer Elvis. He loves Elvis. He thinks he's Elvis. <laughs> yeah, so he takes Waka's, um And he has a team too, which I think is pretty cool because he's like living what he's telling other people. Right. You know? what He's living what he teaches them. Yeah. Like in real life. So I always tease him and I'm like, oh, you old men and your Waka. <laughs> but when I think about it, I'm like... My Makes dad, sense. Yeah. I was like, it's... I'm I'm really proud of my dad and it's cool to see him with his mates mm. and like to chill with his mates because he's always thinking about school and the community and the marae mm. and to just see him relaxed and I'm really happy that he shared his love of wakama with me because like when someone in his team is missing for training he's like do you want to come for a paddle and I'm like yeah I'm there and I love being on the water like it's one of my favorite places right. to be because you're free and yep. just everything's so clear. That's true. And you have to trust everyone in the waka. Because if and one play person your mucks up, psh. Yeah. And I don't like getting my hair wet. No. Nah. <laughs> Fair <laughs> so, enough. Um, yeah. And you have to, you, you trust every single person and you have to trust yourself that you are equally as good as everybody else. Mm. Like you can't doubt yourself when you're on the waka, especially when the wave's coming. Because my dad likes to uh, <laughs> go out. Past the... Not past the bar, even though he, he said, yeah, we're going to go and paddle past the bar. And I was like, no, we're not. <laughs> but he likes to ride the waves. And it's really cool. Like, for me, I used to hate being out Scott's side because I was, like, so city. I was right. such a city girl. Right. Um, but now, I like, any chance that I can either be in the moana or on the moana, I'm there. Right. Yeah. It does something for you as well. It does. It's your connection to the it land is. and the water. And, that, and that's my moana. Like, hokianga moana, that's me. Yeah. And, like, my homecoming, like, the four years I spent there is so, like, I can walk in the Urupa, not just to visit my koro, but I can also visit my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, my great-great-grandmother, my great-grandmother. Wow. That's amazing. And, like, so, yeah, that's one of my favourite places to go to, just have a chat to my koro. Mm. And then where he's buried, you can look up, to Fidia, which is my Monga. So I've got all these connections to my Tupuna and physical land. And I just, I, I feel at home now. Mm. Like that's, like I'll come to Auckland, I'll go to Wellington. And yeah, there's like ocean, but it's not my Moana. Like I always have that. I need to always get home. Mm. Like, yeah. That's so interesting. So a few years ago when you first moved up, yeah, like it's obviously changed a lot. It's ch- yeah, so Hokianga used to be like the cool summer place where you'd like have some beers, get a tan, go for a swim, and then I'd be on the plane back to Wellington. Mm. But now it's so much deeper than that. That like I'm learning about my, the history of like when Cooper came and went back, when Nukutafati came, 
and like going to all the landmarks. Yes, that's a very is historically like, rich place. I know, there. but you know, everyone like Hokianga, and I used to say, "Oh, you know where Opo the Dolphin is from?" Because that's all I knew was Opo the Dolphin, mm. and her, like that too, like shows my age because at the moment, people don't know Opo the Dolphin because that happened in the sixties. That yes. was like even before I was born. Yeah. So I'd associate the Hokianga with Opo the Dolphin, and that was it. Well, it's probably because there's also the statue of the dolphin. In yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but um, there's a new um, cultural centre called Mania, and it, it, it's amazing. You should bring your kids. Bring them to me. I'll take them. And it's like an interactive 3D cultural performance about the history of the Hokianga. And right. the first oh, time cool. I watched it or... Yeah. Because some of the kids that finished year 13 have been employed there. Yeah. So it's to also increase employment in the community mm. and share our history and our stories. I was like, man, I'm so proud to be connected to this place. Mm. Like, and I was like, I, everyone needs to come to Mania. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'd definitely love to come up and see it. Yeah. Especially like with your performing arts background, you'd enjoy the show. Sure. And it's like, it's got like theatre seats. <laughs> like we have two dairies and theatre seats at Mania. <laughs> and like there's a whole interactive movie and there's like an interactive museum section. My dad's like, yeah, go to the um, museum because I, they've got a video of me in there. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was like, of course they do, Dad. But it's cool. Like listening to what he talked about, like he moved home yeah. so that his children, as in us, me and my siblings, always had a sense of home, where mm. home is. And being connected back to wherever we may like life may lead us, mm. we know where home is, and there's always an opportunity to return home. And I was like, oh, I'm living that now. It's very strong. Yeah. So recently, last last weekend, we had my nana's huimati at the marae, and I said to my cousins who who aren't so connected, like they know they're from the Hokianga, but I was like, you need to come home. I did it four years ago, and it's the best thing ever. <laughs> Like, it's, it's one of the best decisions I made. Yeah. Because I'm so strong in my Samoa and I, I know all my family and I can trace my ngafa back um, on my Sapeteia side. I wanted that for my Māori side too. Like, right. And, and like, being, being on the marae, like, at my nana's tangi, like, when people came through, I was like, oh, this, <laughs> I was that person. Like at my koro sangi when yeah. people were like, oh, that's your auntie, that's your cousin. And I was like, I don't know them. Then I was that person to my cousins, like, oh, that's your auntie. And da da da. She was second cousins with koro. And I was like, oh, that's a, that's a cool feeling to yeah. actually be able to greet people who come and mihi to you yeah. and have a connection, whether it's through school or whatever. Mm. Like I actually knew people in my community. Mm. I knew the hokainga. I knew um, the kitchen. Like it made me also want to join the marae committee. To right. give back. Right. Like after everything that was done for my nan, I was like, man, I really, I should be more active within my marae, both yeah. of my marae. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, do you go back to Samoa much? So when I was little, my nan used to take me every year because right. I was the only grandchild. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. Um, do you feel such a, a connection? When's the last time you were there? Four years ago, before okay. I moved up north. Okay. And so I was like, sort of, I wanted to go for Christmas, but COVID. Right. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I, ha I need to go back again. And I think it's important to go with my nana because she has all the stories. She knows all the places. Yeah. She takes us to like where her mum is buried, where her, like, her siblings are at various villages. Um, and that's, those are important stories that even though I've heard them, like I like to hear them over and over again because they're new questions form. And like with both of my grandfathers gone, like I've got so many questions that I never asked because back then I didn't really, it wasn't important to me, but now I'm like, man, I really wish they were around right? Yeah. to tell me their stories again. Yeah. Or like now that something's happened to me, like I've experienced this in my life, like I wonder what their take would be mm. or if they experienced anything similar. Yeah. So I think like having one nana left alive, like for me, like it's really important to ask her those questions and yeah. ask for her stories and just have her wisdom. Like, yeah. Do you feel the same amount of connection with Samoa as you do up north? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like Savai'i. Apparently that was Hawaii. Right. And my granddad is from a village called Eva in Savai'i. So I'm like, 
I've I'm, never been to Safari, but I've heard it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. But I went there like when I was 12. That's the last time I went there. Okay. So, um, and my nana's from Matau Uta. That's where my name's from. Your last name? No, my first name. Your first name, Alusina. Yeah. yeah. So it's Alusina. It's funny because when I was a little kid mm. and I went to a white Catholic school in Palms the North, <laughs> I used to come home. I was so upset. And say to my nana, like, why can't I have a normal name? Can I change my name to Allison or Alice? And she'd just be like, no. And I'd be like, man, I wish I had like a real name. Not realizing, like, how important my name was. It wasn't until my my cousin, um, my cousin Ezra got his matai total, and my auntie and my other cousins. And I was like to my nana, why can't I get one? Because I got so grumpy. I was like, oh, why does a I was title? Like, yeah, I wanted a title. So I was like, I do heaps. Like that was my thing. I was like, I do heaps for this family. <laughs> what does the um, what does the title mean? <sighs> explain it to me. I just, you explain it. <laughs> do to you know what my first thought was? What? It means you have to give money back to your village. <laughs> does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's partially like you do. You still there, there is a monetary exchange, but I think it's like you carry. How many people in a village would have a title? Oh, I don't know. Many. It depends on because there's different. Reasons why people would have a title. And there's different titles, different types of titles. Don't ask me what the different types are right now because it's... Okay. But at the time, I remember being real, like that real selfish, like, what about me? Like, everyone's getting a title. What about me, (laughs) Nana? Like, I thought I was Nana's girl. Like, I should get one too. Like, that's... I had that... And, like, I felt entitled to get one too. Mm. And I was like, oh, what are these guys? Like, my boy cousins are naughty. (laughs) Not naughty, they're mischief. Like, you know... I was like, why did they get them? Like, you know. So why do they get them? Um, why does someone get a title? Various reasons. Sometimes it's so, like not all titles. Like you can't. There are some titles where there can only be one person with that title, and it's not until they pass away that that title can be. Oh, I see. I bestowed see. on somebody else. Sure. But then there are other titles where, like, like four or five of you and your cousins can get the same title. Right. It sort of connects you with your village. What does it mean to have a title? Well, for me, because I wanted a title. I mean, everything. <laughs> I was like, it means I'm the boss. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> but that's what I had in my head, you know. Right. I was like, I want a title. Like, but then my nana explained to me, she was like, oh, man. Like, because I must have been going on <laughs> and on and on and just getting really fat Like, oh, wait, well, they get a title and I don't get oh, I just have to bloody do all the fails and carry it in a bag and, oh. and that's it and I was like Damn. no recognition yeah that's Nothing. like because that's like that's that's the type of person I was but like I wanted to be recognized I wanted to be someone mm. but then my nana like we were in the back of the pickup and she was like you already have one and I was like what what do you mean and she's like I don't ever want you to get a, a Matai title because I don't want your first name to be covered and I was like I don't like because I was like what? I was like, I want to dress up. <laughs> I want the ceremony. I want, you know, like that's what I had in my head. Yeah. Because um, uh, male and females can receive yeah, titles. Yeah, male and right. females can get them. Um, but she said, so Alosina is a Taupo title from a Tauta. Right. So she was like, that's, that's enough for you. And I was like, oh, why didn't you tell me that from the beginning? Break that down for me. So is a Taupo title from... From my nana's vi- village of Matau Tuta, because like when they used to sit and the orators speak, yes, yes, and like I always heard my name coming up, and I was like, "What is go- like? Why are the people talking about me?" And it's like, "It's not you; it's the title." Mm. And so like I, that's when I found out. And so like the Taupo, uh, I want to say she was the princess of the village. But She's the one that always has the headdress. Yeah, so they used to take her, she was like the chief's daughter. Right. And they'd take her to, like, when they visited other villages and she'd, I want to say she sort of looked up, she was like, would counsel her dad, you know, and sort of, oh. <laughs> But she's in a position of responsibility. Yeah, that's, that's. Yeah, so she had her, <laughs> that's, that's, what I was, that's what I was coming to. Who's the school teacher here? I see that. Like yeah, so she had a she was responsibility to her 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 village, yeah. you know, um, and I was like to my nana, oh, okay, like that's what you should have told me that when I was like eight years old and coming home crying, call me Alice, like you know. Yeah, so it's um, quite a special name. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. 
Like, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it means olealo o sina, so the descendants of sina. The descendants of sina. Yeah. Are so we talking s- about sina and the eel? I, I, I want to say it's not that sina. Okay. I feel like there's, an, there's another sina. I've been told the story, yeah. but it's been a long time. But Sina, like, yeah, people are like, yeah, Sina was Sina's one, a legend? She, is it a legend? Or is it one of our indigenous stories that people are like, oh, that's not a real story. <laughs> <laughs> she was to, bel- she was, yeah. If we have a follow-up podcast, I'll make sure I bring the story back. I know, yeah, yeah. I can understand why you're hesitant in talking about it because I don't if we're talking like about something that's invalid, yeah. then people are going to be like... Yeah, I don't want like in your comments... Oh, shit. Yeah, I don't want in your comment section like, oh, who does this girl thinking? <laughs> She's like, there's another Cena. <laughs> like, yeah. But, but well, my nana was really... Anyway. <laughs> she, she, made, she made sure that people didn't shorten my name to Cena. It had to mm. always be Alucina. So when people were like, oh, what do you call yourself for short? And I was like... Alucina. <laughs> Brilliant. Like, don't, don't, my name is Alucina. Mm. Don't shorten it because people try and like call me Alo or they try and call me Sina. And I was like, mm, nah. Mm. It's, it's got to be Alucina. That's great. Yeah. I like hearing that. It's so cool. I've had other people as well say that they've had issues with people uh, not pronouncing their names right. Or yeah. And like at school, like when relievers would come in, because yeah. I was always at the end of the role. Like my because name was last. Because of your last name. Because of my last starting name. Starting for T. Yeah. And like relievers would be like, and is the last person on the roll here? Like, you serious? Not even, no no attempt, even attempt? Nothing? Just a so I'd just be like, I'm here. So for me, yeah. especially living up north, when the kids have tupuna names and they try and shorten them, right. I make sure I like call them by their full name yeah. and they'll be like, oh, fire. Like you don't have to like just call me like. Yeah. TK or something and I'm like mm. no because that's not your name need to understand the relevance of their names I was at a yeah. um, work dinner down in Queenstown yeah. uh, last week and we had to go around the table one by one there's about I don't know about 25 people in the room go around this big table and yeah. stand up just say your name and what you do for the company just so yeah. everyone knows who everyone is yeah. and then the guy next to me is Māori mm. um, he got up and he said his name uh, it was a really short name um, and I do whatever. Um, and then he sat down and then his mates next to him said, um, why don't you say your real name? Say your full name. Yeah. And he was like, oh, no, no, it's okay. He's like, come on, man, say your full name. And so he got up and he said his really long Maori name. Yeah. And I was like, oh, he said it really fast. Yeah. And I was like, that's amazing. Say it again, but just say it slowly. Like, yeah. Appreciate it. Like everyone here wants to hear your name. Yeah. Like, and then he did and he said it slower. But my point is, is like, you've got to understand and appreciate the beauty and like how people were named or why you were named yeah. and what comes with that. Yeah. You, know? you can't just always shorten things because we live in New Zealand where we think that it's more a Western world yeah. that we're taught to believe that things have to be easier pronounced. For other people. For other people. Yeah. But this is not the land of other people. This is a Maori land. <laughs> yeah, but even like um, teaching in Wellington, when I had kids with island names mm. and Palangi teachers would shorten them mm. and the kids would just go with it. Yeah. And I'd, I'd oh man, I used to rein them in. Yeah. And I'd, I'd sit with teachers and I said, you know what you're actually calling them is actually something rude. <laughs> mm. And they were like, what? They never told me. Because teachers, some people actually really want to know. Like you can't just be mad and be like, oh, don't call me that. Yeah. Like you need to have a, so I'd sit with colleagues and we'd practice like how to say their names. Mm. And then I'd give them the explanation behind the name. And they were like, that's so beautiful. I was like, yeah, but you're calling, you're shortening it to this and it means this. And they were like, oh my, they would be like horrified. Yeah. See how powerful being ignorant is? Mm. Is you make assumptions like that and you do that. And then children grow up as well, getting used to hearing that. And so like if anyone ever mispronounces their name, yeah. they say, oh, just call me this. Yeah. Because it's easier for you. Yeah. <laughs> but now I'm like, I'm like, no, people can learn how to say my name. You can. You can learn to say any name. It's actually really easy. <laughs> like when people yeah. see it written down, Compared they're like... a lot of names, it's, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I always think back to that conversation when I'd come home really upset and be like, why can't my name be Alice or Alison? Those are cool names. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're... Is your grandma that told you that? Yeah. 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 It's a bit of knowledge for you. It is. 
and it makes me feel like and then <laughs> when people say oh what does your name mean because they like and I always say oh, it means the chosen one <laughs> Hey. People believe me because if you say it like really assertive or like really like, <laughs> you can say any name really yeah. assertive. Though, you know? Oh no! Like if you like say it with a like seriousness to it, and like I have to just remember not to laugh, and people are like, oh, oh, oh mm. sorry, because that yeah. Probably is the chosen one. And I'm like, yeah, I'm the chosen one. That's why. <laughs> so now, after living for the last few years up north, yeah, is that your home? Is that where you're going? You want to remain? Not like that's my home for sure, but I feel like I've always wanted to teach in South Auckland. Right. So I've been manifesting that, and I've been saying to people, "Why do you want to teach in South Auckland? Why do I? Oh, it's like such a it's a hub of activity and innovation. It really is. And people in their own garages put together stuff like podcasts, I, just like this, you know." <laughs> This is like this is what I want my kids to be like. I can do that, yeah. and they can. Yeah, like, you do whatever. This is you what want. we should be doing yeah. at school, you know. Um, I like the vibe of South Auckland. Mm. I, I've got friends that work at different South Auckland schools, and I see what their schools are doing for the kids and the community. And I was like, I want to be a part of that. Mm. Like, I think yeah. So I I wouldn't say living up in Upanoni, I'll be there for like till I die. Yeah. I feel like I'll be coming and going a little bit because as a teacher, I also really believe that like you need to keep growing your practice mm. and your beliefs as a teacher and you need to have your beliefs challenged as well. Sure. Um, you need to see how other people work and like how can I adapt and evolve as a teacher. Yeah. Um, be quite hard for you to leave though, I imagine. It, because I know. Because you've interwoven <laughs> such deep um, bonds know. and ties with the community. And I was like, man, I either need to everything. marry someone with a helicopter or win lotto and buy my own helicopter so I can just commute. <laughs> some rich people up north. <laughs> there are. Yeah. There really are. I know some I people know up there have helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I see, like, I've always seen South Auckland at some point of, in time. And I, I feel like, but, yeah, I'm just not sure when. I can't tell you exactly when, but I know You'll when the time is. you probably feel it, yeah. just like how you felt the move to yeah. go up north. Definitely. Um, yeah, I've always, always, always wanted to contribute to South Auckland somehow and learn. I think that's a big thing is like, I want to learn and like, what can I do for South Auckland mm. and how can I grow? Um, and just be part of that. Like, cause man, South Auckland's cool. Yeah, it really it's is. It's a cool place, man. Like something I miss about living up north is like, basically there's only Māori and Pākehā. Okay. So when I come to Auckland and my brother's like, oh my God, can you stop staring at people? Because, like, mm. I like people watching, but I must do it really, like, I mustn't be, like... What are you selective. staring at? Like, the other cultures, like, India yeah, and I, Islanders. Yeah, just seeing... Yeah, it's pretty rich. It, and, like, coming from Wellington, you're used to it. Mm. And then going up north, there's, like... Just, there are a few other ethnicities, but not as prevalent as when you are in Wellington and Auckland, mm. where there are so many people... Yeah. Um, ..from different walks of life, different ethnicities, different religions... And I miss that. I miss that. Yeah. Um, so I'm like always just staring at people. And my brother's like, can you stop? <laughs> yeah. We'll go out for coffee and he's like, you just need it. He's like, yeah, either put your sunglasses on or just be like. And I'm not staring because I'm like, Ugh, what's that? I'm just like, oh my God, how beautiful is this country? Like, how cool is it for us to live all together? However, we still have a lot of um, bridges we need to cross to like not be unified. I don't want to be cheesy and be like, be one. Mm. Be unified just to understand and accept each other. Mm. Yeah. I love South Auckland. Like, yeah. I yeah. moved out here probably, I don't know, maybe 11, 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, and that's not f from too far. That was, I think I was more central west. Um, yeah, I still feel like this is like Hamilton because I drove for so far. <laughs> like, I was like, <laughs> I was like, Onehanga is sort of southish. Like, no, it's Sylvia not. Park, that's southish. Oh my and gosh. <laughs> Once you then, cross past Orohu. Yeah. You're into South Auckland. Yeah. Uh, but it's so rich. It's mm. so rich and it's so diverse as yeah. well. And there's... I love the diversity. Yeah. There's a mixture of like really wealthy people yeah. and also a mixture of people, communities as well that are in a bit of poverty. Um, but I think more than anything, and this isn't just for South Auckland, but a lot of communities around New Zealand is that um, South Auckland really has like a real family value. Yeah. 
And the whole thing you talked about, about village yeah. raising children. Um, and something yeah. um, in your first podcast with Kevin, and yeah. he talked about... Um, He's very passionate about South Auckland. When, I think it was when he was in the All Blacks and the younger guys were coming up, he said it was a privilege to be able to be like one of the... People that bring them through. Yeah, he said it's, it's a privilege to like bring them through and support them and teach them, you know, because there's so many people that are like, I feel threatened by the young ones that are coming up, but man. That says more about the culture and who he is. Yeah. Because I believe that like before him or, you know, cultures of the All Blacks past, it yeah. was, it's quite competitive. Yeah. People coming through are seen as competition. Yeah. And that's like, because I've got, so I'm, I'm the eldest of my dad's six kids. Mm. I've got two sisters after me and three brothers. And one of my brothers, he's, rugby's his thing. That's his big thing. Right. And so um, he plays and he's at the rugby academy in Tauranga. Wow. Um, so he's, he's, he's like. That's a pretty cool achievement, right? Yeah. It's so, competition is so fierce to like yeah. get so, anywhere in New Zealand in rugby. Yeah. So Bay of Plenty, he's um, been to training camps for the Chiefs. That doesn't mean he's in the Chiefs. Yeah, yeah. But like, yeah. at least like. How old is he? He's 19. Mm. Um, and I have a cousin that plays for Bay of Plenty. Yeah. Um, so a cousin on my mum's side that plays for Bays, and he was like, don't worry, cuz, like, I'll look after him. And I was like, why? Is someone being mean to him? <laughs> like, but he was like, no, 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 just like, you know. If he ever needs like anyone to talk to, because like it's really competitive, man. It's so competitive. It's a lot of work, yeah. and it's not just that physical demand, yeah. but it's the mental. Yeah. yeah. And I think. I say yeah, like um, like I know this, <laughs> but from it's just from everything I've heard. Yeah. That it's the competition it, is insane. It's that yeah, it's that top ten percent of your mind to. Yeah, um, my son plays rugby, and also he used to play rugby league as well, yeah. right? And at the children's age group on the fields in South Auckland, mm. the competition is insane. Yeah. It's, if you go watch like a kid's game, like you'd just be blown away. The level of talent that's on the field. Yeah. And it's not just talent, it's the creativity, it's the spark, it's yeah. the, um, the flair they have, the yeah. vision to yeah. see the game and the moves they make on the field is yeah. just like... But talking to him about, I said, oh, what's the difference? I was like, I know there's an obvious difference between playing first 15 and like just having now? that, like having the exposure to that chief's training camp. Yeah. And he's like, there's so many plays you have to memorize. Right. And there's, you know, there's so much strategy. And he, and and because he he plays in the backs and the forwards, so he has to memorize what? too. Wow. Um, Sounds so like the damn athlete. He he's, I don't want to say he's amazing, but he is amazing. And I don't know what why. What does he play in the forwards? If you don't mind me asking. Is that a lock? Okay. Is that? Yeah. Okay. I and what in the backs? Wing. Is wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's tall and he's fast. He's tall and he's fast. Damn. And I think, yeah, that, that competition is... Yeah, it's insane. Like even watching him when he played first 15 and yeah. we used to like drive to like wherever they went, we'd drive to. And I was like, I'd look at people on the field. I'd be like, who is that man? Yeah. <laughs> like, they were like... I was like, are you like third year, seventh form? Like, what are you doing still on the field? Like, they are getting contracts offered to them at like 14, 15 to go to Australia and start recruiting for like NRL. I know. At that level. And there's, there's like feeder clubs. Yeah. They bring them in and... Yeah. So I think like, like that's cool. But I think at the same time, like being part of the village, we need to make sure that our young people are grounded in who they are and where home is so that if anything happens... And things will happen. Yeah. That they know... That they can come home yeah. to not to live forever, but just to recoup and regather, and you know, pick their way to up, and then they can like, well, your journey's like, be been redirected somewhere else. Like it's not the end all, mm. you know. So I think that's another reason why I like being at home. So I can say to my brother, "You should come home. <laughs> yeah. You should come home. We'll climb our maunga together. We'll go to the urupa and we'll have a swim in the moana." Good for the so, soul. Yeah. Yeah. Because my other brother who does music, he does that often. Because that's a taxing, that's another taxing industry to be part of. That brother of yours that does music, yeah, that does music, 
I've listened to some of his stuff, man. That is amazing. He's... Teeks. Yeah. Is, yeah. He's, yeah, but he's, he's really fano orientated, so right. he knows where he's from. You can tell. So he'll either be in the Hokianga or he'll be in Tauranga. Yeah. Um, and so, like, that's what I want for... To just to remind my little brother. Because when you're 19, you know everything. So I have to remind myself and my other siblings. I was like, remember what we were like at 19? Hmm. Like, you know, they, they're invincible. Mm. But yeah, I, your um, family's quite diverse. Yeah, yeah. Talented as well. Yeah. That's, that's us. <laughs> I don't really know about Teeks until I heard his... Um, Amazing Grace. Oh, really? Yeah, like, man, I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm oblivious to a lot of things. I am uh, too. And like, <laughs> do you know what? It's not a bad <laughs> But I think I had seen, I had seen, like, some stuff of him, like, on your social media. Yeah. But I hadn't really, like, heard, like, like a proper song of his. Yeah, yeah. And then I don't know how, or I think it was during lockdown or something, I heard, like, his Amazing his, Grace. Yeah. And I was just like, phew, I was just blown away. Like um, that was one of the most um, beautiful versions of it I've ever seen. His version with Holly Smith. Yep, with Holly Smith. Um, Holly Smith is so beautiful, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I heard an interview of hers uh, later on during Level Four, actually a radio yeah. interview, and she talks about it, and she talks about where she was coming from at whatever point in her life as well, and why what it meant to her, and then she talks about collaborating with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but they work so well together. It's such yeah. Yeah, he doesn't talk much. Sure, I, yeah, he must. They're be like my hard. dad. So my brothers are quite about, like my dad. Like they she's just, quite widely recognized, isn't yeah, it? it's yeah, it's quite funny. Not funny, but when people recognize, recognize him. him. Yeah. Um, he strikes me as a quiet sort of person. Yeah, he's a, he's a deep thinker. Like my brothers are deep thinkers like my dad. Like they don't say much, but when yeah. they do, like you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh. Yeah. Like whereas me and my sisters, we talk all the time. Sure. Not saying we don't think. Everyone's different. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. we're just like chatterboxes. Yeah. Um. But yeah, he he was my he came home for lockdown, so it was me and him and the dog for lockdown up north. That was and your bubble. That was our bubble, and yeah. it was I was like, man, this is an ideal life, right? Because right. we live across the road from the beach. Yeah, yeah. Um, he did all the cooking. Right. <laughs> you don't like cooking? I don't. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. Whereas he, I love. cooking. He loves it. Yeah. I love eating. Yeah, sure. I love eating, yeah. and I'm happy to do the dishes. Yeah. Like. That's cool. Yeah. And so we had like our little bubble going and it was cool. We just read, listened to music, went for swims at the beach. Like I know you weren't allowed to go to the beach, but like mm. when you're, it's on your front doorstep, I feel like that's a little bit different. Walk the dog and that was it. And I was like, I could live like this forever. We're so lucky in New Zealand, eh? I know. We're so lucky, man. Like that's what you're just describing there is everyone's idea of yeah, a perfect like, lockdown. Yeah. And then um, my next door neighbour was... Oh, because I live on the teacher compound. So at like at morning tea time, like at school, we'd meet at the fence and have a cup of tea, like just like in the staff room. So we'd right. actually still, we'd yeah, be like talking over distance. our fence, yeah. but we'd have that human contact that was yeah. outside of our outside of our bubble. Yeah, I would see on like little streets around here. Like I yeah. think when we were in level three, of like uh, people having drinks like in yeah. the driveway or on the road. Yeah, but like set up spaced around. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. And we did like, we moved our deck table to the fence and yeah. so did my neighbor. And yeah. we had like dinner together, but not together because there's a driveway and fences, yeah. but they weren't high fences. They're sort of like waste. Do you know, um, we're probably the only country that like looks back on it now as if it was a dream. Mm, I know. And like a little bit surreal about it all, how it happened and stuff. Yeah. Whereas um, I saw a Zoom meeting yesterday at my work with yeah. someone else that was in Texas um, and he's been at home on lockdown since March last year. He hasn't been in his office. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, was like, That's... I was like, whoa. That's, yeah. He said, um, he said the guy, the American guy, said that um, the thing that gets to him the most is, yeah. um, you know how normally you get into your car to go to work? Yeah. So uh, he felt that like when he was, when he normally does that, that's a switch to, yeah. like, into work mode. Yeah. And then he comes home and then he switches, switches back into yeah. But, um, you can't switch off, and that's yeah. I he got. F- was finding uh, burnout yeah. because his office would be downstairs, yeah. and it's just that walk downstairs, yeah. at the end, it was so close that um, for his personal life and his work life, it was hard to switch yep. the other one off. Mm. So I can't imagine like being locked down for for more than four weeks. Eight. So yeah. um, 
when I was doing my online learning with my kids, yeah. um, I was also in contact with a school in the States, right, um, in California, and we, we Zoomed in with them. Yeah. And so our first Zoom, we were in lockdown, and so we were, like, the kids were comparing the differences and similarities, well, not only of the two different countries, but like of our lockdowns. And so we had two lockdown Zoom meetings with them. And then when they were finishing school, or their school year, we were just getting back into the classroom. Right. So their minds were blown that we were back at school. Right. Because they were still at home. And yeah. that was that was like what, last year. So I don't know yeah. where that, that uh, I don't know if they're still in lockdown at the moment. But um, they were just like, are you guys allowed back at school? And they were like, how many deaths in your community? And we're like, none. <laughs> right. And they couldn't get it. They couldn't believe it. Mm. Uh, I said to the kids, Matt, I was like, yeah, like, your sleepings are over, but <laughs> yeah. you are so lucky to be so lucky. So back lucky. at school. Yeah. Yeah. I was up north when it first started. I was working up north. Oh, did you have to come back home? I was in Kerry Kerry. Oh, yeah. And I was about to go into Whangarei um, to do like a trade show, some trade event. Yeah. And at that time, it was starting to like sort of ramp up. Yeah. And I was wearing gloves, I think, because I meet a lot of people. Right. And I was wearing gloves and some people were wearing, odd person was wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. And then just like that, it happened. Yeah. I had to come home. Everything was cancelled. Um, it was really fast. It was so fast, yeah. I remember my dad was like, because the Ministry of Education must have been doing, like, emailing the principals. Yeah. And he was like, at the beginning of the day, he was like, no, 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 no. Like, yeah. it's, it's fine. Like, this is what the education minister. So he was reassuring all the teachers. Right. At the and beginning then, of the day. At the beginning of the day. <laughs> by morning tea, yeah. that wow. had changed. Yeah. And so I had to prepare learning packs for all my kids. And then one of the other teachers, she was away because she was sick. She'd been sick for the week. It's just, so just before Jacinda makes that announcement at lunchtime. That, that's, yeah. that this is it. So 48 he, hours. He said, so before she did that announcement, he said to us in the staff room, he said, just in case, prepare learning packs for at least two weeks. Like that was his thinking. He's like, at least, he's like, just let's be on the safe side, two weeks give them physical learning packs and like have like you know we could be back tomorrow next week or but just for so I had to run around do my class and I've got one of the biggest classes in school and then I realized how many in your class 27 which isn't actually that big sure but when you meet my kids it's like having 400 <laughs> no, <laughs> they're just so vivacious that I was like oh my god right um and then I realized that other teacher was away so I did a um her class as well. I did her class as well. Got them all into the office and I, and I named them and everything. I said to the office wow. lady, this is my class. This is her class. So what's in a learning pack? I put in their Duffy books because we'd right. just been delivered Duffy stuff books. stuff for them to take home eh, yeah. for the next couple of weeks. Um, workbooks, just any random, like I just made random work, a booklet of worksheets. And I was like, oh, like I'm just going <laughs> to, I was like, why? <laughs> crosswords which the kids are like crosswords mm. and I'm like yep yeah, I know you guys love them not really like word finds coloring in like anything it's just to occupy anything, their minds like journals worksheets to go with those journals all of your students have access to internet no right so like some got Chromebooks yeah and some were like off the grid so much that they didn't even have power at home like <laughs> so Damn. they're like got our quote like <laughs> and that's just the norms for them yeah 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 no they power just, they live off the land right which is cool. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Fire out. Yeah. So it was, I was like, man, when am I going to miss? Oh, I missed my kids and I was like, when am I going to see them again? So then like, yeah, I just made t like textbooks. I hate giving out textbooks because it's such boring learning. Worksheets. Like, I was the, like. Sorry. The, sorry. The ones that don't have like internet or power. Did you, did you talk to them at all during lockdown? No. 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 Okay, hold on. This is New Zealand. This is, I understand. This is like the Hokianga to me, like, because um, I've been up there, to, I taught a show up there back mm. in early 2000s. Yeah. Like, Hokianga to me is like, uh, it's like the islands. Um, I remember driving through, I think it was Panguru and... Um, oh, yeah. The north side. Broadwood. That's what we called north yeah. side, where Broadwood. the south side. Okay. 
But like so far, it's, it's like stepping back to the islands where yeah. kids are riding around on horseback. Yep. Um, the little gardens out front of the houses is yeah. real similar to Tonga. Yeah. And because it's just speaking te reo, just yeah. te reo. Um, so I understand what you're saying. However, though, like how do they stay up to date with like, um, you know, they were, Jacinda was giving updates every day yeah. about where everything was at. How do they stay up to date with that? I, neighbors like, and stuff. Parents, yeah, neighbors, parents had cell phones and stuff. Right. Um, like I had. How do they charge their cell phones? Oh, they have like some had generators and stuff, or they just right. go to if their bubble was like a neighboring farm that had power, they'd yeah. But bursting some bubbles up there. <laughs> yeah, it's the younger. But wow, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, some kids don't have power. Like they just yeah, it's crazy. Like when I moved up north, it's crazy to us. It's not crazy to them. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, you're right. Like I moved up north, and I was like, man, it's like being in Samoa. Mm. Like everything closes so early. <laughs> And it's hot. I it just, it's like being in Samoa. Mm. And that's, I remember ringing my nan. I was like, honestly, I feel like I've moved to Samoa. Mm. But Samoa's got more of a town. <laughs> mm. Yeah. You know? So those kids had no contact with you for the five weeks. Yeah. Well, and yeah, five weeks. Because they didn't have to come back in level three. So right. some, so they had an Stay. extra two weeks. Wow. Um, See, that's wild to us. But <laughs> other countries, they've been doing it for months yeah. and still doing it. Yeah. Like, I wonder what it would be like had we not done that for a week. Like, would we be back in lockdown? Uh, continuously, I think. Yeah. Continuously. Like, when you guys went into... Level three again? Your level 3.5. Nice. <laughs> uh, my sister was up north because she's a TV producer. And she was shooting up north. Right. And so she was like, I'm just going to stay here because yeah. if I go back down to Auckland with baby, like, and his dad lives up north, so it was easier for her to be in Northland right. than to come back down. And then yeah. should she need, like, you know, to bring him back to his dad, she, she wouldn't be able to. So yeah. we, so she was in lockdown, but not really because life was normal up north. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Doing it again wasn't easy. Yeah, I bet. Wasn't easy. Um but that's because we had done it the first time. Yeah. Then the kids went back to school. Yeah. After a couple of weeks or something, they came back home for school holidays. Yeah. Another couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> and then they went back to school for a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. They, they came back home again for lockdown. So it was like, yeah, it was hard, especially having four kids. Yeah. And you know, entertain them all again. But I, after the first one, the idea or the, not the romance of it, but the, Nice things about it have sort of worn off. That's right. Yeah, the and novelty's gone. Yeah, the novelty's gone. <laughs> it's now the nitty gritty, like. Yeah. And so yeah, so I think if we never did it the first time, it would happen a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it's also lucky as well that New Zealand saw it as like a um, something to do together. Yeah. Because most countries, like, of course, they implement stuff, but I everyone know. has different ideas, and yeah. they're like, "Nah, we're not shutting down. Nah, we're not locking down." Yeah. And different factions and stuff, and that's what. Um, that's what's kept them sort of hindered because they're so divided and... Yeah. Like, the locals up north, I was really surprised that they complied by everything. Right. It was people that came back to their holiday homes that annoyed me the most. Just for lockdown? Just for lockdown. Like, and I... <laughs> wow. Because I'd walk my dog in the morning. Yeah. And like, because when you live in a little town, you know what the Airbnbs are. Oh, you are. understand exactly And you who's... know when someone's not from, like, not from there, but like, isn't a local... Right. And, like, people bought their boats and jet skis out. And uh, I was like... Right. It's yeah. not a holiday. It's no. lockdown. And would use them? Well, like, no, she made in the law. first week yeah. they did, but then the Coast Guard started, you know, and then I was like, ha <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, like, already our health system up north is pretty dire. So just imagine if anything, like, you know, it's stretched as it is. Like, yeah. during, like I wish people would think about things like that. They don't care. No, they don't. They really don't. Like, like when it comes to, no, but lockdown like brings people right down to like the yeah. bare essentials and they're like, oh, I want to be comfortable. Yeah. I need my toilet paper. Yeah. I know. <laughs> like the toilet paper thing was crazy. It was nuts, right? Yeah. Like do people still have toilet paper in their houses? Because they must have garage fools. <laughs> some people do. I reckon some people do. Really? But yeah, but it was just, it was just nuts. It was like, yeah. did you ever make that connection? Did you ever understand? I didn't what? understand it at all. Like lockdown for me, like, it, it made me really take a look at, like, do I need all these things that I have? Mm. So I did a big haul of, like, clothes and shoes and 
books because we like to re- like our family likes to read. So we're right. like, oh, do we need all these books? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then because my brother he's he eats plant based, so he introduced me to plant based eating. So I was really healthy and fit. Wow. Have you ever done weeks. that before? No, because like this vegetarian. He was vegetarian, and I was like, "Oh, that's just what the hell is a vegetarian?" I was yeah. like, "Why can't you eat meat? What's wrong with you?" Well, so you went vegetarian? Yeah. Wow. Lentils. You never done it before. Ooh, lentils are such a good time. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Like I don't think I could ever do it. You know, I love well, meat. My brother is such a good cook. Okay. That I was like. This is yum. Wow. Like if I had to do plant-based by myself, I'd probably just be like broccoli and rice like because I wouldn't know what to make. See, that's what I would probably be like as well. But he is so Creative. like, they're like my dad. My dad's such a good cook. My dad does all the cooking at home. Mm. So when I moved up north, by the way, <laughs> I moved home, like home, home. Like I live with my dad. So he cooks. So he does all the cooking. <laughs> I try and cook, but he's like, oh, what are you doing? Oh. And I'm like, ah. Uh. Very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, no, 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 don't do it like that. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. And saying like, I'm this is my spoiltness. Like, and then when I go home to my mum, she, she does all the cooking because I'm on holiday. She's like, no, 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 you're doing all right. Well, one day soon you'll be married, you'll have your own family, and you'll be cooking. No, no I think I'll find a husband. <laughs> 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 I'll have to marry someone that can cook. <laughs> yeah. What is um? What are other things that you aspire to achieve? going forward and you would have thought about this because you've been a school teacher now for eight years yeah that's mm. a long time man well, it went by so fast you know when I first started teaching yeah. like my first year I was just uh, yeah I thought my first after two years I was like oh that's a long time but when I think about eight years that's mm. a long time to be a teacher some people do it for 30 something years I know like my parents yeah. who are still teaching yeah yeah um, that's long to me yeah, I think like if you've been at the same school for 30 years, like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Have they? Yeah, some, no, no, my mum's my mom's moved around, so has my dad. My dad's like moved all over Northland. Right. Like, yeah, my, my siblings grew all up all over the place. Um, that's so, why I think it's really important to move around, to mm, meet new people, mm. see how other people do things, to just stay fresh, man. Stay on top of your game. Yeah. Because when you get into your comfort zone as a teacher, and Stop I've growing. I've been in there, I've been in that comfort zone. Yeah, I've been, and I knew like at one school, like I loved, I love this school, I love my kids so much, um, and I thought I was going to be at that school forever. To be honest, I was like, I'm never going to leave this school, and then I knew, <laughs> I knew I had to move when, <laughs> like we were just chilling in class. Like I think I was just tired. And the, I said to, they were like, what are we doing now? And I was like, oh, just like, let's just chill for a little bit. Like, and they're like, oh, happy. Ad. Like, and the whole class was like, oh, cool. So they either, you know, a group of kids were chatting, some were drawing, some were playing a board game. And like where my classroom was, like there's a top window. And I just happened to get up and walk. I don't know. Maybe I was going to change the song because like we had speakers and I'd always play music in class. And then I saw the principal walking with visitors. Right. And I was like, Freaking I said out. to my class, do something. I said, oh, get a book out. Mister's coming. We need to look busy. And by the time he walked the corridor and got to my classroom door, this terrible story. <laughs> it's a real story. Yeah. And I'm so sure he, you're not the only school teacher <laughs> that's going to tell me the story, right? He, he opened the door with these visitors. I don't know if they were ministry people or parents that were looking at the school for their child. <laughs> And he walked in and all my kids were working. They had their workbooks out and someone said, like, hi, sir. Like, do you want to come and see what we've been writing about this period? And then I was like, in my head, I was like, this is not good. This is not good. (laughs) This is terrible teaching. Teaching your children to lie. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, (laughs) oh. like, And that's when I was like, man, I need to, I'm so comfortable in this school Mm. and like, that's that. That's when I knew I was like, I need to freshen up, freshen up, and yeah. not be uncomfortable, but yeah. be the new person again. Keep learning. Yeah, and like, so it wasn't a bad. It wasn't a bad reason yeah. why I left, but I was. I when and like when that's he definitely left. not a bad reason. To, I've heard of teachers leaving for far worse reasons. Yeah, and that's when I in my head I was like, that's that's so bad. <laughs> Kids at school shouldn't 
be able and they they got into all their reading and writing groups and they got all their like modeling oh. books out and Such they like kids. just some like Such some of the boys kids. just like rubbed out the date and put today's date up <laughs> like to be like this is what we wrote today and I was like detail of lying I was just like oh my gosh like oh no like yeah so that's that's when I knew like I'm so comfortable and so happy like this can't like this is a great place mm. to end it not end it but you know to finish off and in a good on. space and okay where's my next journey taking me to and it's funny because the, the those kids that I had in my first year of teaching they were year eight I got invited to a 21st this year wow. yeah and that for me yeah that's like to be remembered like that and I was just like <sighs> that's true I was like okay I can stop teaching now someone remembered me when they were 21 and then wow. I was like, oh, my God, you're 21. Yeah. yeah. Is it yeah. a guy or a girl? Girl. But most of them, because they all turned 21 in 2020, most of them had lockdown birthdays. Right. Um, That's pretty special. It, it was. It was. I was like, wow. I didn't think of any of my teachers on my 21st. Neither did I. But, but yeah, even her mum and dad were like, because I taught her brother as well. Right. So I said to him, hey, I better get invited to your 21st. <laughs> And he said oh. to me, because he's 19 now, he said, it's really, really weird drinking with you. <laughs> <laughs> he was so uncomfortable. He was so uncomfortable because yeah. I was just chatting away. And he, he was like, he was like. His anxiety is like yeah, yeah. level 100. Yeah. And he said, and I said, are you okay? And he said, to be honest, that's just really uncomfortable having you, like. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow Yeah But by the end of the night He was comfortable with <laughs> but, but I was like That's so funny Because yeah It just goes to show The level of what you give And yeah. how it stays with Yeah The impression that you make Yeah And I said to her Like oh no I didn't say to her I just thought Man well, I only had her she didn't have very many friends Growing up It's one <laughs> of the two But I'm sure it's the first one oh, it's, Yeah <laughs> She said Like because I said Man I only had you for a year Because I came oh. in When she was year eight and I, I like I looked back and I was like, man, was like she was like finally someone that looked like me and thought like me taught me the way I needed to be taught. And she loves school and she's graduated from university, she's got a job. Wow. And I was like that I was like, nah, you just love learning. Like you could have done that with any teacher. And she was like, nah, because she also Cook Island family. Yeah. And um I was too shy to get up and tell this at her twenty first, but she she came she was really quiet, quiet, beautiful girl, really quiet, and she said to me, Miss, do you wanna see like a CD of me dancing? And I was like, Oh yeah, like thinking it's like at a twenty first or something. And she was like doing a comp, a competition of Cook Island dancing. And then I was like, Oh my god, like <laughs> I ended up plugging it into the projector and I made the whole class watch. Yeah. And I was just like I was just in awe and the kids were like, Is that you? Because she was so quiet. And she was like, yeah. And then I said, okay, you're going to be the poly club leader. And she was like, what? <laughs> and then her, like, like knowing that from her, she just grew. And even through high school, like, her love for poly club grew and grew and grew. And she still dances. Wow. And it just I said, did you show your old teacher this? And she's like, I tried, but he wasn't interested. Wow. And she, I just saw her in a different light and so did all her peers. Yeah. And the 21st key that her parents gave her is actually the photo of her dancing. And that's I was like, a beautiful story. I said to her, that's my, yeah. that's, that's my dancing video. Like mine, like I'm the person that taught her how to dance, but I, I didn't. <laughs> like, mm. But I just like nurtured it. And I, I feel like with our kids, they have all these amazing talents and skills, but sometimes they just need that person to unlock it. Mm. Like they've got it within them. Mm. You just need a. See and that sometimes potential. that person is not necessarily their own parents. Yeah, because sometimes you like you're like yeah, you're my parents. You have to say that. Mm. <laughs> you know, I get like that. Mm. And that she was like yeah, so I was like, that was a big thing for me to be just the invite itself. So I made sure I flew down for it. Wow, you flew down for her twenty first. Yeah, I was in Wellington and I was up north. And I said, of course, I wouldn't miss this. Maybe the only time I get invited to a twenty first, but. <laughs> I doubt it actually But it meant, it meant so much And especially after a really long year Like a COVID year Of just feeling exhausted And feeling like I wasn't doing enough I was like Oh for someone I was enough And that's enough for me Yeah Yeah 
It just takes like the one or two students that you really impact to make everything worth it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that's right. That's one or two, one is fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it goes back to my motto of like, why do you teach? To grow good humans. Mm. That's my job. <laughs> and that's what I really love doing. And I think if I was to lose the joy of it and the love of it, I'd need to stop. Right, right. Because that means it's someone else's turn to grow that within someone else and my mm-hmm. time's up find something else to do can I just ask like on average give me like a ballpark figure what sort of range is the salary for like school teachers in New Zealand oh when you start it's like I want to say it's like 42,000 okay so it's really low but then like when you register it goes up and if you have units which is like management positions that's like get, deputy principal principal yep yeah, or like um Head, head of, of science, yeah. yeah. Um, syndicate leader. Then that's, that's with, obviously more. Yeah, you can you get so right in the middle. I if wanna, you were just yeah. a teacher, yeah, but you're registered, and you've been working for maybe five, six I'm, years. I want to say forty six thousand. Forty six. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, how much do I get paid? <laughs> Not much. Not much for everything they were expecting. Under fifty. To do. Uh, maybe oh. around fifty. Not more than 60, though. No. No. Because people think teaching is like, you go in, you're like, this is today's lesson, this is the worksheet you're going to do. You get school holidays. And you get school holidays. If it was that easy, like, everyone would be a teacher. Right. Like, man. It'd be really boring, though, wouldn't it? (laughs) Well, some people would probably gravitate towards it because of yeah. that. <laughs> but or like, you know, I'm going to write the notes on the board, you copy them down. Yeah. But that's not what teaching is anymore. Yeah. Because schools were like, they, they, were, they started so that they could get, like, it was during that industrial era. So you were getting people ready for the factories, you know? At school? Yeah. Really? That's why school was started. I didn't know this. Yeah. But not here in New Zealand, like in the, in the UK. UK and stuff. Yeah. But then their education system came here. <laughs> and wait, like, wow. you know, yeah. It, and then it was really... School was originally brought up to like... Yeah, to get you ready to work in the factory because that's when the industrial area sort of took off. Mm, right. Whereas now for me as a teacher, like, and I try to explain this to adults as well because they're like, oh, you should know that. You're a teacher. And I was like, mm, I, I prefer to think that I'm a facilitator of learning. Right. Because I can't hold all the knowledge in the world. Mm. Whereas I can get you thinking and questioning and I can show you like how to find resources. But you have to come up with your own thoughts and opinions of issues that matter. Your idea of doing that is what they do at uni. Yeah. You can do that at primary school. That's pretty cool. The earlier the better. Mm. And people like... Man, little kids, they've got sharp minds. They do. They're like sponges. They, they absorb they are. everything. So I, I don't Good like when they're constantly measured. Yes. Like what reading group are you in? Yes. What colour are you reading at? When they have so many other skills. And like then we sort of like... Narrow it down to them being yeah. measured according to their academic yep. ability. Whereas I have kids that are so knowledgeable... When it comes to reading the water, like currents, yes. where to fish, yeah. the best fishing spots, um, their knowledge of the bush and the forest and hunting, those are things that I can't teach them. But they, it's, it's their way of life. And like, it's not... So for people like that, for kids like that, yeah. what is the use of school then to them? Break it down like really simply. What is, what's the pros of them going to school? Oh, I've never been asked that question before. But it's such a relevant question. Yeah, it is. So, like, for me, it's like, well, what do you know and how can I put that into your schoolwork? So, like, I always try and figure out what do my kids love to do? What are they really good at? And how can I use it in the classroom, in their classroom learning? Like, relating back to different contexts, like maths. Because maths wasn't my favourite thing at school. Like, I really struggled with math. Um... But when you put it into a real life context, when I'm like, man, when you're on the boat 
And I was like, what kind of mass do you use on a boat? And man, their mass comes just like that. Or like building, building things. I'm like, if you put it, and even being on the marae, like when I try and teach estimation, <laughs> I'm like, okay, you've got 100 manuhiri. What will, like plan the menu for the hakiri. And something that I really push is financial literacy. I think that's so important. It's not really taught very much in school, is it? It's, it's, it's part of the curriculum, but not a focus, like, because everyone's like number, strategy, and strand. But man, I, I really push financial literacy. Um, what I sort of things is that that they learn? Budgeting. Um, teach them about lending, borrowing and lending money. I didn't know this. Yeah. It's, and I always say to them. I was never taught this. Really? Yeah, so if you're not taught, like, real life skills at school, where are, where are you meant to? But, like, do you know, were you taught Pythagoras' theorem? Pythagoras, Pythagoras theorem? theorem, yes. Yeah. So how often do you use that? Never. But if you were taught, like, financial literacy, how often would you use that? Every day. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's things like that, like, you know. And kids learn about high purchases and interest. And that's how they learn, like, percentages a lot easier then if you were just to teach like fractions, ratio, uh, fractions and percentages and decimals together. Just I feel like paper. I've been ignorant because I didn't know that schools teach this now. Yeah. So there's like um, ASB. Were you taught this? At school? Yeah. No. Okay. I learned it all when I was at school. So it's not just me. Like as a teacher. Right. So in Wellington, ASB has a really um, good education program and they send this guy out. This is really funny. Um, his name's Vanessa Puanga. And they, he, like, he came to school and he taught the kids. And I was like, man, like he, because he's got a performing arts background. And I was like, man, he puts on a good hour-long show in the classroom. Te-. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Not the show, but like the content that he was teaching. I was like, yeah, I can teach that. What's his content? Um, like teaching the kids about um, FPOS, the difference between an FPOS card and a credit card, like getting loans out. This is what I'm talking about. Um, um, like earning money. He was like, you can earn money now. Because when he was young, he like did lawn mowing or something. Um, savings account, getting a bank account, because lots of kids don't have them. And so I went to different school, uh, when I taught at different schools in Wellington, like everyone used to always hire him. And I'd be like, <laughs> I'd see him and I'd be like, yeah, different school, like same person, all good. And then last year, one of the teachers was like, oh yeah, ASB's gonna send someone out. And I was like, oh yeah, there was a really cool guy in Wellington that did a really good job teaching the kids. And then I walked, <laughs> I walked into the school reception last year and it was him right. and he turned around and he goes, what are you doing here? And I was like, oh my God, are you still me, bro? Like, <laughs> and he goes, do you live up here now? I was like, yeah. But he did such a good job and I was like, oh, you need to come back and do it for the, the senior primary school as mm. well. But it's so important. It's so important. It's so important. Yeah. I didn't even know this has been taught. I've spoken a few times before on this podcast about I think that stuff like this should be taught is yeah. more important in our schools. Yeah. It is. Well, because some people are not all academic focused. Yeah. And some people, for me as well, like a lot of stuff I learned in school is almost irrelevant. I mainly need to learn how to read, write. Yeah. Like and reading, writing math. and basic math. Yeah. Absolutely. Everybody but needs But the most that. important thing I learned from school is probably just um, relationship. Yeah. Like how to interact with other people, how to yeah. treat other people. Yeah. Um, so like key competencies, like managing self, yeah. participating and contributing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's really great. Yeah. <laughs> you never answered my question. Oh, what's the question? <laughs> Sorry. What are, your, what are the future things that you want for yourself? You're so involved in being a teacher that you go off on talking about it. Oh, yeah. Sorry. But, um, yeah, because you've done it for about eight years. Yeah. So I looking think... forward for you. Well, <laughs> like I'd love to run my own school. I think I would. I don't, um, wow. Yeah. But I also like wonder like how could I market myself as a teacher or like create resources for teachers of like Māori and Pacifica students so that they can see themselves in the curriculum and mm. they can see themselves in the like our school journals at the moment are just so cool like to have like different stories like um, that the kids can identify with and they're like oh yeah I've done that before or, I've been there right uh, that's like my auntie that does this. So I think it's really important to diversify our curriculum so our kids can see themselves within it, but I just haven't figured out 
what I could do because I was like, oh, I don't want to be like a 70-year-old teacher, like classroom teacher. Like at the moment, I love being on the front line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what you're but talking the about future, though like, yeah. is like really going into more the politics of like yeah. um, changing the curriculum and... and yeah. Making it work for our kids rather than making, making our included. kids work for the curriculum. Like, right. But I haven't, I haven't thought or planned that far yet. I'm still trying to just teach in South Auckland. <laughs> I'm sure it happened real soon. I hope so. <laughs> it's been great having you on the podcast. Thank you for having me. No, it really has been really great. I love everything that you've spoken about today. Thanks. Um, like I felt like when you first asked me, I was like, oh man, you've got like super famous people and you're asking me. And I was like, what do I have to say? And then I was like, actually, I've got a lot to say. I just never say it to anyone. 100%. Because I'm worried about being judged and like being wrong. But I was like, if we don't talk, then how can I be corrected? That's right. Just be nice when you correct me and your comments. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But also I originally created this because I wanted to hear from a mixture of people, like everyday yeah. people. I wanted to hear from all walks of life. Yeah. Um, and just sitting down with you for like two Nearly thing? three hours oh my now. God. Nearly three oh hours. My God. Yeah, just sitting down with you for nearly three <laughs> hours. Like, it's so insightful about what you do, and it makes me have so much more respect for what school teachers do. I already did, which is yeah. why I got you on because yeah. I thought school teachers are. Um, it's a like a career that I always thought was like a really hard career, a really tough career. Yeah. Um, and something I find like I I think that like when you guys go to school, go to work every day. Yeah. It's not just like clocking in and clocking out. Yeah. It's, um, I'd like a job like that one day, but just not yeah. yet. I still have a lot to give. I wanted to bring you on because I think school teachers need to get the respect they deserve. And when they do strike for more money for their salaries, yeah. they deserve it, which is why yeah. I asked you those questions about how much they make. Yeah. Um, and their role in raising our children is so important and relevant that yeah. they deserve the respect that they should be given. Sometimes yeah. they don't get that respect, but yeah. I think they should be acknowledged. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Alessina. Thanks, bye. Cheers, guys. Yo, was the mic on, mic? They took that mic on, mic, and pour us another one. Let's do it right, though, mic. We feeling nice, though, mic. Gather round, gather round. And took that mic on, mic. And took that mic on, mic. Yeah. Garage drinks with Mike.